Racing for the message is being broadcast by the Department of Defense of the Republic. At 2 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, multiple unidentified objects were confirmed to have entered Earth's atmosphere. Discovery Houston, 20 seconds to LOS Tetris. The first message that comes to you is you are a divine being. You matter. You count. You come from the realms of unimaginable power and life, and you will return to those realms. The vast stretches of the unknown and the unanswered and the unfinished still far outstrip our collective comprehension. Broadcasting from Forest Tower Studios, all the way from the Deep South. Now, here is your host, Joe Root. Good evening. Welcome to Lighting the Void. I am your host, Joe Root, and we are broadcasting all the way from the Deep South in Forest Tower Studio. This is Lighting the Void, your voice for verity in this crazy realm of polarity. It is Wednesday night, September the 19th, as the moon waxes on into midnight, and the call-in number for the show is 1-800-588-0335, toll-free from the United States or Canada if you want to call in, and the show itself is live on the website, which is lightingthevoid.com. The network is thefringe.fm, which is on a whole host of syndicates, including TalkStream Live, TuneIn, and The Run. That TalkStream Live uh, listen line is 701 719 719-3971. ST Joshi is here with us and my producer and partner Eric Markham to talk about Lovecraft, the Necronomicon, the mindset about this whole thing. Why are we so addicted to it? The fascination. And, by the way, is the first uh, atheist I've ever had on the show, which is I can't wait to talk about this as well. And more coming up here in just a moment. Uh, I want to say thank you all who have donated to the show. I really do appreciate you guys so much. And uh, tomorrow night I will announce all of your names. I'll give you all of your shout-outs as well as all the new social media followers. Quick business, though. The show was brought to you by Audible, and you can get your free Audible trial at audibletrial.com forward slash LTV radio, which is, uh, I'm an audio book fanatic, so if you're like me, go grab one of those. <clears throat> and you get one for free, 30 days. And if you don't like it, just cancel your subscription, but you'll get hooked just like I did. Uh, anyways, so that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. Now, you know uh, that this show is about everything when it comes to the search for truth, and that's why we're doing this, too. But I was informed by Mr. Joshi and Eric Markham that I'm a lunatic, and I was like, really? The actual word <clears throat> means uh, affected by the moon, and I'm totally affected by the moon, so therefore I'm a lunatic, and I'm okay with that. I'm totally okay with that. Uh, oh, don't forget, if you want to support the show, you can donate right, right from the website or the network. You could also use the Amazon portal. I need to get that portal on the web, on the uh, network site, too. And then there's a Lighting the Void t-shirt you can grab. Eric and I are working on the Fringe FM swag as well. And so there's all kinds of ways you can support if you find anything of value from the show. I want to thank Eric Markham, my uh, producer and co-partner on this network, and Jeremy Scott, the program director, and all of those who... Uh, help me every day on this show and uh, I want everybody to welcome Alex Exum to the network who just went live for the first time on the Fringe FM it was, what a great guy that is, uh, he is I'm glad he's here with us um, the hashtag on Twitter if you want to use Twitter is hashtag LTV radio <clears throat> but let's get this uh, let's just get this thing going I've I think I've talked about everything I need to talk about now ST Joshi is a leading authority on H.P. Lovecraft, Ambrose Bierce, H.L. McKinnon, and other writers, mostly in the realms of supernatural and fantasy fiction. He has edited corrected editions of the works of Lovecraft, several annotated editions of Bierce and McKinnon, and has written such critical studies as The Weird Tale in 1990 and The Modern Weird, Weird Tale in 2001. His award-winning biography, H.P. Lovecraft, A Life in 1996, has already become a collector's item. 
an expanded and updated version, I Am a Providence, The Life and Times of H.P. Lovecraft, was published in two volumes in 2010. But critical biograph, uh, biographical, uh, biographical, come on, man, come on, Joe. And, uh, you know, I'm Southern. I have a hard time with big words. And editorial work on weird fiction is only one aspect of Josie's multifaceted output. A prominent atheist, Josie has, Josie has published the anthology Atheism, uh, a reader, and that's in, that was in 2000, and the anti-religious uh, polemic, God's Defenders, What They Believe and Why They Are Wrong in 2003. He has also compiled an important anthology on race relations, Documents of American Prejudice in 1991. And uh, he has also compiled uh, biographies of H.P. Lovecraft. 1981, revised in 2009, Lord Dunsany in 1993, Ramsey Campbell in 1995, Ambrose Bierce in 1999, Gore Vidal in 2007, and H.L. McKinnon in 2009. He has edited Supernatural Literature of the World, an encyclopedia, in 2005, and I'm not done yet. Icons of Horror and the Supernatural in 2006, and Icons of Unbelief in 2008. His recent monographs include The Angry Right in 2006, Junk Fiction, America's Obsession with Bestsellers in 2009, and The Unbelievers, The Evolution of Modern Atheism in 2011. He has also published two works of detective fiction and has written a supernatural novel centering around H.P. Lovecraft, The Assaults of Chaos. And uh, Mr. Joshi, glad to have you on the program, and thank you for coming on, and thank you for being here. Sure, glad to be here. And uh, say hi to everybody. Eric, Eric is with me on this one. Hey, y'all. Glad to be here. So let's jump right in this thing. I, the first question I want to know right off the bat, right off the bat, is what do you think, uh, Mr. Joshi, about all of the fascination that is going on with... I didn't even know about Lovecraft until I got into the occult. I'm going to be honest with you. I got into the occult, which got me into science fiction, and then I saw how popular... Lovecraft was the Necronomicon and a lot of people, what they call the dark side of things. It's just really huge. And we talk about this on the show, our fascination with things of that nature, dark beings, uh, conjured beings, th- science fictional beings that come from other realms. We, you know, we've even brought up why black Sabbath changed their name to black Sabbath. So there's some type of thing that's going on in our brain that really attracts us to these things. And I was wondering what your opinion was on that. Man, that is a, that is a difficult question. I mean, in terms of why why Lovecraft has survived and and flourished beyond anybody's dreams, you know, here we are, eighty years after his death, where other writers really haven't. I, I mean, it's 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 to me, it's baffling. But I think we can shed some light on the on the picture. I mean, first you have to start out realizing how incredibly obscure Lovecraft was in his own lifetime. He had no book of his stories published during his lifetime. Now, he died young, admittedly, at the age of 46, but he had tried to get some book publishers interested in, in, in his stories. It didn't happen so, for whatever reason. Uh, he wasn't a very good promoter of his own work. I mean, he, was, you know, he was, didn't have that kind of, kind of drive to, to, to get, get book, books published. Um, but there he was. You know, by the time he died, and at the age of 46 and a half, literally nothing of his was in book form, with the exception of one, one story that this shadow over Innsmouth had come out in a, in a wretched little edition, you know, a few months before his death. So then what happens? Well, his friends, and, you know, he had established this incredible uh, connection with all these different people through correspondence. Uh, People like August Derleth and then Donald Wandry said, hey, we can't let this stuff go to waste. We can't just let this be forgotten. So they they took a lot of effort and started putting this together into into books. Um, You know, they formed their own publishing company, Arkham House. Uh, to publish these books, but even those were really very, you know, very small circulation, you know, a few thousand copies uh, of books. And, and for, for decades thereafter, Lovecraft really was, uh, you know, kind of a, kind of a, you know, very, very small niche author. Uh, then all of a sudden, in the 70s, really, late 60s, maybe 70s, things started to happen. His work started to go into paperback, and then, and then it just snowballed from there. But as to why it happened, I'm I'm still puzzled. I think part of the answer is Lovecraft didn't write individual stories, uh, especially later on in life, his last decade of life. Each story builds upon uh, what went before, and so these stories are all linked. You know, sometimes you know 
in a minor way sometimes more significantly. And so they create a kind of whole universe of horror. It's, a one, it's almost like one huge novel that he was writing, and you know, just writing chapters or facets of. And that allows the reader to get into that world, even though they're separate stories rather than you know, one connected narrative. And so, you know, that opens up a whole realm of imagination that, that it's very hard to duplicate, except for somebody who, you know, like, like Tolkien, who wrote an actual trilogy and, and then uh, wrote stuff after that. That's kind of the only parallel I can think of, or maybe the Sherlock Holmes stories, which are, you know, again, are separate stories, but nevertheless seem to occupy the same kind of universe with, you know, certainly with Holmes as a, as a recurring character, but... Uh, um, you know, it's uh, and of course Lovecraft, the power of Lovecraft's imagination. What he was doing was so totally different from what had gone on in the past in in terms of horror supernatural fiction. It was something really totally new, and I think people at the time recognized it, and certainly we recognize it now. So it's more like it really touches the imagination in places that uh, a lot of other books and other things don't, and it also comes from a, like a whole other world. I think. Like H.P. Lovecraft, it's a whole other world, basically, that you can just, every time something that he brought out, you're tapping into that same world. That's pretty sure. cool. I get that. Sure. And, and, and the fact that, you know, so many people, certainly even in his own day, amongst his own friends, and then many other writers later on, added to this universe. It became a kind of what is called a shared shared world uh, uh, universe, where anybody can contribute, you know, and do something new or add to it. And that, again, that's, that creates a kind of snowballing effect. I mean, some guy can, published a, a bibliography of all these so-called, you know, what he called the, the Kulu mythos, you know, these uh, various writings by other writers. They're like, they're like thousands of, of pieces, uh, stories, novels, poems, I mean, you name it, uh, that other people have written to, you know, uh, drawing upon Lovecraft. I mean, and that is also uh, almost unprecedented in literature, I mean, to, to the degree that it's happened. Now, I'm going to ask you in a second, Eric, uh, what, why you got into it. But I, did you see the, um, uh, Mr. Joshi, did you see the series Stranger Things? Uh, I haven't, actually. That has Lovecraft all over it. And I was just wondering, it seems like they're trying to implement it in TV now. Oh, uh, there's so much going on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, absolutely. Um, I, mean, I, I don't have the, 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 the uh, I'm, I'm not a big media person. Uh, I, I kind of stick to literature, but nevertheless, I know of a lot of lot of treatments that films, in particular, have have uh, draw upon Lovecraft. I mean, you know, I just read an article that uh, uh, maintains that uh, 2001: A Space Odyssey has a, a fair amount of Lovecraft influence, uh, partially because Arthur C. Clarke, you know, who was obviously instrumental in that film. He himself read Lovecraft when he was a teenager, and, and, and it stuck with him all through his life, and so it came out, you know, maybe even not even aware of it, but it came out in 2001 and other works that he wrote. Uh, and there are other films, you know, Prometheus, uh, Ridley Scott's Prometheus, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, is clearly derived from Lovecraft, and there are many other examples of that sort. Go ahead, Eric. I know you got a question. Well, I think some, I almost wonder if when when Lovecraft became more or less rediscovered back in the 60s and 70s was not people he created a thirst for more and maybe we have J.R.R. Tolkien's popularity to thank for that rebirth in Lovecraft's work because people were just grabbing at anything paranormal or you know the Cthulhu mythos was already out there you know, here's another world to get in, involved in. Do you think that might have had anything to do with it? Oh, yeah, I think so. Because, you know, again, Tolkien, I mean, his trilogy came out in, the, in like, 54, 55. I'm not sure how popular it was when it first came out. But then, you know, when it got into paperback in the late 60s, it really took off. And and I think there was a big thirst there for, for you know, uh, that kind of, of stuff, fantasy, horror, science fiction. Uh, and people like to go back to what was written before. I mean, there was a whole series that Lynn Carter edited for Ballantine Books called the Adult Fantasy Series, and that had a couple volumes of Lovecraft in there, but many other writers that he resurrected uh, and, you know, gave, gave new, uh, a new readership to, you know, from, from the early part of the century or even the 19th century. Uh, and Lovecraft sort of caught the wave of that. But he, he's gone on, you know, way more than, than other writers have done. 
part of that, I think, also is the fact that Lovecraft's work is not really tied to his historical period. I mean, to some degree it is. Uh, inevitably, it has to be. You know, I mean, uh, obviously he doesn't use cell phones or things like that, but uh, he doesn't talk about a lot of the mundane things that, that a lot of the literature of that era talked about, you know, about basically doesn't talk about money or sex or, you know, how to make a living and stuff like that. Uh, it's very um, uh, detached from its era in some ways, and so it allows people from other eras like us to, to go into that world without, you know, a lot of barriers. Well, I, I do want to commend you on like, something, too, like just before, and I'm not trying to jump subjects here, but I've never had an atheist on this show, and to see somebody that that writes about it and really is not afraid to come out and talk about it, I know there are people like that, you know, but... The friends that I have that are atheists, when we get into a group or or um, group discussion, they're kind of afraid because they feel outnumbered and they're afraid to speak on it. And I've always wondered about that. Like, why why don't people speak on it more? Because I think there's some valid points to it. It should be heard. Well, sure. I mean, uh, I, I've sort of lived a <laughs> somewhat sheltered existence in which I tend to associate with people, uh, you know, kind of, I wouldn't say exactly share my beliefs, but, uh, you know, we... Um, you know, we sort of pretty much see eye to eye on things, so I've never had a fear of speaking out. And uh, quite frankly, uh, and I well, maybe I'll get into this later, but uh, a lot of my atheism comes from Lovecraft, too, because when I started reading and studying Lovecraft, I went beyond the stories and started reading his letters and essays and other stuff like that. Uh, and he was a, a very fervent atheist and argued on the subject, I thought, very uh, cogently. I mean, uh, I was convinced by a lot of his arguments. Um, and then I read from him. I was inspired to read other writers like Bertrand Russell and uh, a number of other you know writers of who who were atheists, and and that convinced me, and I and I remain convinced to this day. Now we have um, obviously in music, uh, you know, a lot of people know about Lovecraft. They talk about um, his drug use and stuff, and people want to, you know, there's everybody likes to judge, right? They always want to judge and say this or that. But the thing is is even in music and art, I've found that when people go on these moments of drug use in their life, it, I hate to say it, but really good work comes out of what they're doing. I mean, some of the best work comes out of that stuff. Do you think that that influenced his writing at all? Uh, I don't believe Lovecraft ever took any drugs of any kind, uh, except except coffee with a lot of sugar in it. <laughs> okay, kind so of it's just a rumor to... then. Because uh, I've been yeah, hearing that, that I have people. never oh, heard of any. I, 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 I'm quite certain he did not take any Okay. Illicit drugs, at any rate, and uh, certainly he was too poor to to get them, and they were they were pretty hard to get in those days. Uh, so no, he he was not a drug taker. In fact, he warned people away from that. In fact, he he said he didn't need that. I mean, his imagination worked on its own. That's you know, great. much of much of his writing, remember, comes from dreams. I mean, who knows why he had these incredibly bizarre dreams that he did? I mean, you know, he did have a certain a, lo- a number of personal traumas in his life, especially in his childhood. I mean, his, both his parents ended up dying in mental institutions, things like that. I mean, that, that kind of been, couldn't have been good, but uh, um, but he, from the age of like five, five and a half, he was played with these horrible dreams, many of which were kind of like little little stories. I mean, they actually had a kind of a narrative, and oftentimes, uh, you know, at least on three or four occasions, he was able to just write down his dreams into actual short stories. So that's kind of where his imagination comes from. Okay, so then that, <clears throat> I mean, if anybody would know, you would, and that you know how rumors get started. It, it could just go around and turn into something that's totally not true by the time sure. it wraps circle, you know. So uh, yeah. I'm thinking that um, I'm pretty jealous of uh, people that can write, like people like you. I mean, I can run off at the mouth all night long, but as soon as I put pencil to paper, I can't move. I just go uh-huh. blank. I mean, Well, it just takes, takes practice, I think. I mean, I started writing, you know, when I was like, 13, 14. Initially, I wanted to write short stories and novels. You know, wanted to be a fiction writer. But fair, I, I wrote a lot of junk back then. But became quickly uh, uh, came to the realization that that really wasn't my forte, and so I switched to literary criticism. Uh, although I didn't know much about that either, but uh, uh, I seemed to get some success on that. And you know, it just it just takes practice, I think. Do you got uh, any questions? I know you're chomping at the bit over there, Eric. I want you to get in on this too. <laughs> Well, I mean, if if Susie Lovecraft were alive today and treated a child like she had treated HP, she would probably, I mean, if the media got a hold of it, she'd be one of those viral bad parent videos you hear. 
I mean, she yeah, referred I mean, to I mean, him it's, as it's, hideous. I know it's tough. It's really tough. I mean, I don't want to, you know, you know, criticize her. I mean, she was in a very tough, tough. Basically, she was a single mother. I mean, you know, her husband died when when uh, Lafrey was eight years old, and she had to raise the kid mostly on his own, on her own. Although she had her grandfather there for a while, and then you know some. Uh, aunts or you know sisters who are Lovecraft's aunts and uh, but um, she herself was pretty much traumatized. I think you know her husband died. Uh, you know well what what we now know as syphilis. He apparently was a <laughs> shall we say not a, not quite a traveling salesman, but you know that kind of thing where he went around you know uh, and probably uh, 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 fraternized with prostitutes and things like that and got syphilis. They really didn't quite know what it was, but they knew it was something something along that line. It was something, you know, not to be spoken of, you know, in the late 19th century. And, and I think that really affected Susie. And she said, oh, my God, what has happened here? You know, what, what is this horrible person I married? Um, and I think she transferred some of that loathing on to her son because maybe she was afraid that Lovecraft would come out, you know, would turn into, you know, her his father. So, uh, but she coddled him in other ways, and 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 you know, and and indulged him, and you know, bought him a chemistry set when he was eight years old, and you know, he, she did good things for him as well. So, it's 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 tough. I mean, it's um, I, I, she was in a she was in a tough position. Well, what I'm trying to figure out is well, I find it yeah. is and real quick, go ahead before I forget this is Eric knows that I'm an occultist, so I study the occult. I've practiced it. I'm not afraid to say it because uh, it's just hidden knowledge type stuff. And when I got into this, I saw that a lot of uh, chaos magicians uh, would really tap into Lovecraft's material. They would try to use their mind to conjure the characters of Lovecraft. And and I always, I th- I'm thinking out of all the characters, out of all the books, out of everything, because chaos magicians believe you can conjure anything. It doesn't matter if it's on this world or not. Why are cultists picking Lovecraft? I wonder why that is. Well, I think part of it is because he himself created what he, I mean, he he actually called it a pseudo-mythology. I mean, he created these gods and and worshippers and, and, and I mean, it was kind of like a fake religion. Uh, Now, he knew it was fake. Now, uh, these occultists, you know, tend to take it seriously, and that's that's (laughs) their choice, I suppose, but uh, Lovecraft was writing fiction, and he knew it, but... um, Sure. Uh, because his work has this mythological uh, superstructure, it it imitates uh, the function of religion, and and you know occultism is uh, a kind of religion of its own. What was you going to ask, Eric? Well, when you look at, I can see how if you look at how H.P. Lovecraft viewed mankind in general, we were just these insignificant dots. You know, one of his more famous quotes, we live on a placid island of ignorance in the midst of black seas of infinity. So, you know, it's obvious he doesn't have that great a opinion of what humanity is, as opposed to, say, the Christian faith, where, you know, of all the planets, especially at that time, we were the only life in the entire universe, and that there was this benevolent God that looked out after us. He's well, that's why almost, one scholar, he's, he's uh, uh, the uh, one of my close colleagues, a man named David Schultz, said Lovecraft didn't create a mythology; he created an anti-mythology. Because what is the function of most religions in the on Earth, and even in, in occultism? I think it is to establish some sort of intimate connection between human beings and and their gods. Right. But Lovecraft is saying, no, that's rubbish. Uh, there are these human worshippers who think they're worshipping gods and think they're getting things out of them, but in fact these gods, who are really just space aliens, don't don't give a damn about them. And and that's the that's the uh, kind of the substructure that, that underlines nearly all of Lovecraft's great stories. Well, uh, you know, I don't want uh, honestly, people that know the show, they know that I'm just trying to get answers. Now, I myself, I believe in some type of source and i believe that it's divine but i'm when i hear and that's just my belief but when i hear people say like god a man in the clouds or something like that even science when they study consciousness it doesn't really add up to that it's more like a some type of virtual reality system uh it doesn't mean that it's not good but i don't know why people don't realize that there are bad things out there sometimes i think maybe lovecraft helped us realize that i don't know 
Well, I mean, as I say, he was, you know, see, you've got to be careful interpreting his stories. His stories aren't literal uh, uh, expositions of his thinking. I mean, he is writing fiction, and he's writing horror fiction, uh, and, and the idea of horror fiction is you write something to scare people, okay? But you can't scare other people unless you scare yourself. And so uh, it's a lot, of, a lot of what Lovecraft is doing is trying to scare himself by, by kind of subverting his own, own philosophy, oh, okay. uh, if that makes any sense. Um, but the point is that, that to my mind, uh, there's, there's a strong atheistic current uh, to, to much of what Lovecraft wrote. Do you believe that, too, uh, well, even the gods he, um, Even the gods he had were not benevolent. I mean, Nyarla Hotep, the messenger of the god, he was the crawling chaos. Cthulhu, when Cthulhu rose, when, when he eventually rises, mankind's going to be wiped out. So as a reader, you're thinking, why are these people, you know, what is it about Cthulhu that makes these people want to worship him? Do they think they're going to toady up to this indifferent deity that's going to wipe them all out anyway? Well, I think that's exactly it. I think what Lovecraft is saying, especially in that story, The Call of Guru, is that these human worshippers are actually mistaken in the sense that yeah, they're looking forward to, you know, the the, the reign of Tulu again, you know, as he as he emerges from from the waves. And they think that, that they're going to be in a very nice position afterwards, but they in fact they are going to be wiped out. So they are simply in error and and in that sense Lovecraft was playing he was kind of being an anthropologist. He was saying you know, why do people believe in a religion? What is it that attracts them to religion? They want some sort of connection uh, to this spiritual being, and even though it's a horrible spiritual being, they still want that connection and, and will do anything to, to uh, preserve it. What was the, uh, if you don't mind me asking, the first Lovecraft book that you ever read? Well, this is interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm racking my brains, and it's been, it's been a long time. You know, I've been reading Lovecraft for most of my life. I think what happened was, you know, those, uh, I guess, I don't know how old you are, but I'm, I'm old enough to remember when, when this publishing company, Scholastic Books, uh, you know, you could buy Scholastic Book paperbacks, you know, from, from school, uh, you know, yeah. in, in junior high school. And, and, you know, I remember like that in the 80s. Were they, uh, when I was for in... me, it was, this was late. 60s, probably maybe early 70s, let's say. Okay. Um, anyway, I bought this collection Thank of you. stories called, called 11 Great Horror Stories, edited by Betty Owen, a um, 95-cent paperback, and it had the Dunwich Horror in it. Now, I don't specifically remember my impressions of reading the Dunwich Horror, but I must have had, you know, the name probably stuck in my mind, because I'd never heard of Lovecraft before. Then later... I went to my public library and saw these three volumes of Lovecraft stories from Arkham House, you know, the standard three-volume edition that, that had come out in the early 60s. And I said, wow, this is, looks interesting. You know, the, again, the name Lovecraft just intrigued me because I, uh, you know, I said, well, I've, I've never heard of this guy before except in that one story collection. And so I, I actually made a mistake in the sense of I started reading at the Mouths of Madness, this short novel. Now, that is a very difficult work to read because it's full of scientific terminology and things, really kind of dense. And, and kind of slow moving also, and and as I started reading it, I said, "Oh man, this is this is way beyond me," because I frankly didn't know very much about science at the time, and so it was just I felt it was just you know beyond my comprehension. So I put that away, and a little while later, I read another volume called The Dunwich Horror and Others, which actually consists of his many of his best stories, and that is what really got to me. Stories like The Rats in the Walls and The Color Out of Space and uh, Whisper and Darkness. I mean, that that's what made me a big Lovecraft fan. Now, if I would had if I was interested in it, but I'd never read Lovecraft before, what would you tell me? Would you would it be Lovecraft? What book would you tell me I should start with? Maybe. Oh well, if I may toot my own horn, <laughs> um, I was asked by Penguin to edit these annotated editions of Lovecraft. It came out to be ultimately three volumes. <clears throat> I didn't know I didn't know they were going to go to three volumes, but uh, the first one I I edited was The Call of Tulu and Other Stories. That was 1999. <clears throat> and uh, I included a lot of Lovecraft's best stories. I couldn't include everything because Lovecraft wrote a lot of good stories. So uh, I, I felt that those were a lot of the best stories in there, whether it be early stories like Dagon or The Rats in the Walls or later ones like The Call of Tulu and Whisperer and Shadow War in, in, in Smith. 
Um, I like to think that that is a really good introduction to Lovecraft because it also, <clears throat> if I may say so, has my learned commentary and notes and things, which I think helps the reader along to understand the stories a little better. What about you, Eric? What was the first one you read? My mom had a, I think it was one of the Penguin collections that had a, what turned out is the, this weird character. He sort of had rat teeth, a human face that was covered with hair, empty eye sockets, and a rat tail that went in one eye socket out the other and dangled down its cheek. And it was from the story Dreams in the Witch House. The witch was haunting this air, this house, and that was her familiar. Okay. And at the end of the story, the you know, this, this well, don't, is what I mean, don't give away the, the book. The stri- what, what's the name of it? What's just the name of the book? Because I might read it. I don't want uh, you to give was, me the it, plot. <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> I think that was a uh, Valentine was paperback. It was one, one of one or six or seven Valentine papers yeah. that came out in the early seventies. All right. Cool. All right, Absolutely. Let's... Yep. That's it. That's it. You guys in the chat, if you've read one, let us know. Let us know what you think. We're going to take our first break, guys. We'll be right back with author St. Josie. Don't go anywhere. Lighting the Void Radio. The truth is out there. There's something out here. And so are we. KTOK Digital Broadcasting, The French FM. From Studio 303, it's the Stranger Than Fiction News for The Fringe FM. Bringing light to the stories that surround us. Doctors are shocked to find a spider spinning webs inside a man's ear. A Chinese man who checked himself into the hospital because the pounding sound in his left ear wouldn't go away was shocked to discover that the noise was being caused by a spider spinning webs deep inside the ear canal. Doctors recently told reporters that the unnamed patient, a man in his 60s, had come to the hospital to complain about a drum-like sound and tingling sensation in his left ear. You can see the photographs and the rest of the story at oddityscentral.com. And a mysterious person that proposes a toast left booze and roses at Edgar Allan Poe's grave for 70 years. The life and death of Edgar Allan Poe are just as mysterious as his tales. Whether people wanted to present the American writer as a dark enigmatic character or things that just occurred obscurely, no one can tell. If not puzzling, the events surrounding Poe's death were at least inexplicable. A hundred years after Poe's death, a stranger approached the gravestone of the writer. It was dawn and the mysterious man was dressed in all black, with a white scarf and a wide-brimmed black hat. He placed three red roses and a note on the grave, poured himself a glass of cognac, and recited a brief toast. After leaving the half-empty bottle of cognac next to the roses, the stranger left. The next year, this stranger showed up again, performed his short ritual, and left the scene. He went on repeating the same ritual on the 19th of January for 70 years. He remained anonymous and was called the Poe Toaster due to the celebration toast for Poe's birthday. You can read more of this story at VintageNews.com. And a Michigan fisherman takes a picture of a Bigfoot. A man in northern Michigan released a photograph of an alleged Bigfoot creature. The man who goes by the name of Jack claims he was on a fishing trip when he came upon the seemingly bipedal animal, which he initially thought to be a bear. Quote, it was about six feet tall and had a human-like figure. This is what he told Bigfoot Evidence earlier last week. Not specifying when the encounter happened, it had a high-pitched growl. We made eye contact and we both froze in our tracks. The shadowy figure then reportedly ran off into the woods. 
He goes on to say, I went back later on and camped out there just to see if I could get lucky and get more pictures. But it turned out empty-handed. Jack believes it was a juvenile Bigfoot, mainly because of its relatively short height. It's not clear why the eyewitness didn't take a video instead of a series of photographs. However, last month, another man in Michigan said that he had an encounter with a similar creature back in 2017. He claimed the biped had a four-legged pet with him. You can see the photograph and read more of the story at cryptozoologynews.com. And it's time for the Stranger Than Fiction's Fun Fact. Of all the words in the English language, the word set has the most definitions. The word run comes in at a close second. And that wraps it up for another edition of the Stranger Than Fiction News, right here on the Fringe FM. I'm Vance Nesbitt. Stick around for more Lighting the Void with your host, Joe Roop. This is Jason Lindgren from Crow 777 Radio, and you can hear us 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time every Saturday night here on The Fringe FM. This is Cortana from Shift Happening, telling you to pour a glass and park your ass as you're listening to KTLK, The Fringe FM. Shift Head. Folks, this is very important information. What's to be said about CBD? ancientlifeoil.com. Our CBD is made from hemp and has 0.003 THC, which means this wonderful product won't get you high. No matter what amount you take, what does CBD do for the body? My hands are tied, but you can Google CBD benefits and be astounded. When you're finished reading, you'll want to log on to ancientlifeoil.com. That's ancientlifeoil.com and purchase. Life is good when you feel good. People are tired of pain. People are asking for non-GMO organic products to help them with, (laughs) you fill in the blank. Legal in 49 states, and again, our CBD is made from hemp. Ancient Life Oil is about helping people one by one by one. If you wonder how good the product is, the CEO takes it every day without miss. AncientLifeOil.com. That's AncientLifeOil.com. Have a great day. Howdy, this is Catalina, and you're listening to Lighting the Void with Joe Roop. Joe Roop. It's uh, cool that we're talking about on our way towards Halloween. We are talking about the author H.P. Lovecraft with author S.T. Joshi, well known writer in this field, and also uh, Eric Markham, my co producer and partner on the network, is with us simply because I don't think Eric, Eric would want to miss this for the world. If any of you guys know him, he talks about Lovecraft quite a bit. Uh, don't forget the show is here for you four nights a week, Monday through Thursday on the Fringe FM, 9 p.m. Pacific, on into midnight Pacific. And uh, I guess where I wanted to take this next was I know so many people that really love Lovecraft. I mean, like, they not just Eric, lots of people, Mr. Joshi. And when I read about his life story, which I have read a little bit about it, it seemed like, did he not, did he get popular after his death? Because... He should have been selling books left and right. Uh, I don't know. It just doesn't seem right. With as many people that love yeah, his writings, I mean, how come he didn't have really a lot of money? Tough. Was that? Well, he, I just think he's... Sh- I'm just wondering why he didn't have a lot of money as with as famous as his writing is. You know? Well, I think he was way ahead of his time because what happened was in the 20s particularly, like 20s and 30s, uh, mainstream magazines and publishers really didn't want to publish horror fiction or supernatural fiction because they felt it was kind of sub-literary. They really, it was just popular trash, basically. Uh, so, the, you know, magazines like, you know, Saturday Evening Post or uh, Atlantic Monthly or, you know, where you can make a lot of money by selling a single story simply wouldn't have taken stuff like that. So what happened was that the pulp magazines, like Weird Tales and Amazing Stories and all these others, uh, 
kind of filled the void here, uh, you know, and they publish a lot of this stuff, but they only got a penny a word, literally, and not even that sometimes. Um, and so the only way that a writer of that sort could make a living is by huge quantity production, you know, and Lovecraft simply never wrote the very much. I mean, he simply, you know, it just wasn't in him to write a lot of stuff, just turn out the stuff, because, you know, it, writing for him was a very important thing. I mean, he took a lot of care in writing and, and, and just, you know, want to do the best he could, and, you know, if a story got rejected, you know, he, he was really crestfallen, he was hurt, and, and didn't revise the story to suit that editor's needs, and as as he went along into the 30s, his conceptions became so vast and so, you know, uh, extraordinary that, that the pulp editor simply didn't understand what he was writing. I mean, uh, the editor of Weird Tales rejected At the Mountains of Madness because they, he thought it was, oh, it was kind of slow, you know, it you know it takes a while getting going, it's a too long to publish in a single issue, uh, you know, and, and Lovecraft was really, really shattered when that story got rejected, and it sat around for five years before it finally got published in Astounding Stories. Uh, so... You know, it just it wasn't it wasn't wasn't going to happen. You know, I mean, Lovecraft was just too far ahead of his time, and it took took decades after his time for his stuff to be understood finally. Well, I have a certain people that believe that that they're kind of spiritualists and occultists like me that believe that some of because he had a rough life. I mean, obviously, he had some rough things happen in his life and in his family. And they say, well, you know, it was his writings that he called upon these dark beings that came into. And this is more of a spiritual religious type belief. But I tend to think that maybe the life that he had that was hard helped influence his writing. And what do you think that it influenced his writing at all? Oh, there's no question. I mean, there's there's so many autobiographical touches in his work. And, and in fact, some critics have believed that writing was a kind of therapy for Lovecraft to sort of, you know, overcome all these these. Uh, issues that he had, you know, with his parents or, you know, his lack of money and all sorts of other things. You know, he had a failed marriage also. And, uh, you know, uh, through his writing, he kind of, you know, maybe got that out of his system in some ways. I mean, we don't want to deal with uh, the dark side of, of uh, our nature. We don't we don't mind scaring ourselves, right? But we don't want to talk about it. We don't want to deal with it. It's it's termed negative uh, in a lot of uh, conversations, but I think uh, it's a bit therapeutic to actually tap into the the dark side of things. I've you know I kind of learned that from Crowley too. Not saying mm -hmm. I um, I love Crowley or anything, but the guy said, "Look, it's not really wise to just deal with every positive side of everything all the time. Sure, it's better to be positive, but you're just burying all this other stuff, and you should let it out and let it out artistically." And I think I see yeah. that in Lovecraft's uh, writings. Yeah, I mean, Lovecraft, I mean, you know, he, he got into the weird at a very early age. I mean, you know, first he read the Arabian Nights and was fascinated by that. Then he, then he was stumbled upon this uh, illustrated edition of uh, Coleridge's great poem, The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. It was illustrated by Gustave Doré, a great, great 19th century artist, and he thought that was an incredible, uh, you know, piece of work in terms of stimulating his imagination and you can still get that edition by the way out there from from dover it's uh, it's been reprinted um and then he read poe at the age of eight and just went on from there and that was his you know you know he became a horror aficionado for life thereafter and was always seeking out you know great works of horror fiction in fact he once said if i found stuff you know out there that's already been written uh, you know that of, of the sort that I wanted, that I wouldn't be writing at all. But he he didn't, you know, because he felt he had some things to say that hadn't been said before, and that's that's what he was trying to do. Uh, one more question, and I'll let you ask your question, Eric. I, I um I want to. I'm trying to write a book about a certain subject, and this is more of a writer's type question. And I told you earlier that when I when I put the pencil to the paper, it just feels like nothing comes out. And I read uh, Stephen Pressfield's book, The War of Art. I've tried to figure out how to do it. What would you say to an aspiring writer, uh, how to get going or how to get, or just any uh, tip about writing? Well, the, you know, it depends on what you're trying to write. I actually think nonfiction is easier to write in some ways than fiction, because fiction is literally coming right out of your head. I mean, you have, you have nothing to draw upon except your own imagination and your own experiences and things like that. Nonfiction, you know, you're researching something and you can, you know, uh, get information that way. 
I would start small. I mean, write articles or short stories first and then go on to books. I mean, I've written a lot of books, but, but um, it took me a while to learn how to pace yourself to write a book. I mean, you certainly need an outline to begin with, uh, and then you just start writing pieces of it. I mean, if you think about a book, my God, you know, two, three hundred page book, my God, I'll never get that done. But you got to start. You just got to start, and and you know, little by little, you know, don't think about how much you have to go. Just focus on on you know the particular chapter or, or uh, subject that you're at, and then just add it little by little, little by little, and you know, eventually, you know, in a six months, a year, however long, you you'll, you'll have a book. You got uh, any questions, Eric? I know you do. I don't even know well, why I'm... asked that. <laughs> well, you know. You had touched on something about how his writing tended to be. There were certain characters that when I would read, like uh, Randolph Carter, a recurring, a recurring character, he seems to always be the somewhat frail of constitution, somewhat like Lovecraft saw himself. I almost wonder if the reason Randolph Carter showed up in more than one story is that he was Lovecraft or even whether consciously or subconsciously, the Randolph Carter character, when he was being written, Lovecraft put himself in that in that character's guise. Oh yeah, I have no doubt about that. I think I think there's more to Carter than just being a stand-in for Lovecraft, but that's certainly an important component of it. I mean, you can particularly see it in that novel, The Dream Quest of Unknown Kadath. Now, that novel was written right after Lovecraft came back to Providence, Providence, Rhode Island, you know, his birthplace, from living these horrible two years in New York City, you know, in this failed marriage. And he had an incredibly awful time there. You know, I mean, just one thing after the other happened. He got robbed and all sorts of things, you know, bad things happened. And he just ran back to Providence with his tail between his legs, basically, and said, you know, that's, I don't belong in New York City. I belong in my hometown. And what is the dream quest of a known Kadath about? It's about Randolph Carter going all around the dream world, you know, from one place to the other, all these incredibly fascinating uh, places. But he's looking for his what he calls his sunset city. And at the end of the, of the novel, Nyarlathotep informs him, you know, your sunset city is nothing but your memories of your hometown. In that case, it was Boston, you know, that's where Randolph Carter came from. So it's clear that Lovecraft is saying, all right, I, I, you know, this is a novel about me coming back home and 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 uh, realizing that I'm I'm a, 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 a man of Providence, Rhode Island, and not not somewhere else. Now, some people would say I think his experience. No, go ahead, Eric. You, go I'm ahead. sorry. I think it'll, it'll, you know H.P. Lovecraft would take a big hit today because of his racism, which I almost wonder. I'm sure it got fortified in New York because of all the immigrants there. The, the, he had that xenophobic fear of other. But in the same breath, he marries a Jewish woman. So how deep was his, would it be fair to call it racism and not just xenophobia? Yeah, that's, it's a very complicated it's, issue. I think a lot of it came from familial upbringing i mean you know i think his, i wouldn't say i mean it's hard to say his parents or his you know other other members of his family were racist too or whatever but you know old time new englanders of that sort i mean they you know they felt they were you know they were the aristocracy of of, of providence and new england and that's that's you know uh, they resented all these foreigners coming in from eastern europe or asia or latin america or wherever because you know they felt that it was their their realm you know and, and they were on the top of the heap you know uh, so when Lafayette went to New York and said, wow, look at all these other people from all over the place, and they're the ones who are actually being success- successful, and he was not successful. I mean, he couldn't get a job. He, you know, his little apartment got burglarized, and he was just had an awful time there. Um, in terms of marrying, marrying the Jewish woman, I think a lot of Lovecraft's views on this subject are very abstract. 
it was like he argued this on paper that you know that that races shouldn't mix together and but it was very theoretical when he actually met somebody of a different race or you know or ethnicity he actually was very warm to them if he had something that you know, in common with them he had a number of jewish friends and and you know a number of friends of all different sorts different classes too i mean he didn't he didn't have prejudices against you know the high born or the low born anything like that so I think a lot of it was very theoretical. It's something that he argued about, you know, uh, as a kind of a, as a philosopher. But in terms of real life, it kind of all fell away. Well, okay. yeah, it that's was a different time as a too, whole yeah. were bad, but individuals were, you know, he would learn. He would actually get to know the individual. I think of how he being raised as he was as. You know, basically a Mayflower family, just about. There had to have been this. We're better than the hoi polloi out there. We're, our family line goes can be traced way back into the British peerage, and you know, then there's these other people that go out and work for a living. Wasn't that one of the main problems when his wife said, "You know, he can come with me." To, to Cincinnati where my business will flourish and the whole idea of, you know, actually didn't she offer to open up a millinery there in Providence, but the ants had this kind of patrician notion that there's no way we could have a Lovecraft being a, a tradesperson. That's right. They, that was beyond the pale. I mean, you you know, you can't have a their nephew married to a tradeswoman. That would be horrible. I mean, it's hard for us to understand that attitude. But remember, you, we're talking about almost a hundred years ago, and people thought very differently then. They felt that 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 kind of status and 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 you know position in society was very important to them, even though they didn't have a lot of money. You know, their money had all dissipated. They once had money. You know, the grandfather, Whipple Phillips, was actually a very successful businessman. I mean, uh, apparently that, they didn't hold that against him because he was, you know, uh, in, in real estate and things like that. So that was a cut above just, you know, a hat shop and things like that. Um, but when he died in 1904, a lot of the money somehow got, I don't know what, frittered away somehow. We don't know exactly what happened, but they didn't have much money in and after that, uh, you know, his three sisters, three daughters, you know, Lovecraft's mother and, the, and two aunts just had to live on the, a very small inheritance. Because, again, women didn't work. These women are not going to work in their 40s or 50s. It was, that was also inconceivable. So, you know, that was it. I mean, it was a very different time. It takes a lot of mental energy to throw yourself back in, in, into the time where people thought very differently. Well, I, I mean, I'm just... Um... My son, who's 13 years old, he he actually brought up H.P. Lovecraft the other day, and I never said this on the show. And and I'm just curious about both of you's opinion on this. I don't want to stifle my son's ability uh, to express himself or learn creatively or artistically, but I will be honest with you. He, my son is very susceptible to being scared, you know, like even when he would see things that weren't there, it would freak him out. And so... He asked me my opinion on it, and I said, well, it's probably going to scare, scare you a little bit. And he said, well, should I? I think one of his friends on the bus gave him a book or something. I don't know if I should let him read it. As a 13-year-old, I know that might sound crazy to, to y'all, but maybe well, I should. Well, that's exactly what I read, Lovecraft, and it certainly affected me. I mean, I... I kind of like being scared. I mean, I wouldn't say it's because I know it's all fiction. I mean, that's not really the case because it sticks with you even after you finish the story. Uh, because because reading Lovecraft it affects your whole life. It affects how you look at the universe, and that's that's I think in in one sense the, the mark of great writing that it that it sticks with you even long after the story is finished uh, and affects the, just the way you look at things. Um, I don't know. I mean, you can't you can't shelter people forever, you know, and I don't think 13 is at all too young. I mean, Eric, you say you read Lovecraft even earlier than that. Um, so I think that's actually a very good age to get Lovecraft. Yeah, I feel like i got to protect him from every little thing, and I think it, it kind of gets ridiculous after a while. You know, you got to you're right, you know, you got to let them. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I was raised in you know, a very different circumstance. I was raised, you know, uh, I mean, my both my parents worked, so I, you know, I was, I had to come home by myself. We didn't even have a bus. I mean, I had to just walk home or, or ride a bicycle from back from school, and nobody thought anything of it, you know. I mean, it's like nothing happened to me. I mean, you know, uh, but, you know, I, 
basically had a lot of time on my own and uh, you know whatever and I I filled it up reading books and whatever but um I think I think parents may be a little overprotective these days that's the impression I get I get the the idea of when I talk about atheism like I still think maybe Lovecraft was I don't know he seems like he was a little bit spiritual but I could be wrong I mean on his you know, the dates of his birth and death, he had some correspondence between someone, I forget what it was, but he had a quote that said, I am Providence, which was a line from his personal letters. And, you know, Providence means the protective care of, care of God or of nature as a spiritual power. I mean, that's the definition of it. Sure. So, but, he was, but he was referring to Providence, he was referring Rhode to where he lived. But I was thinking, is it yep. a play on words, or is he just saying, you know, I am this place? I, I, no, I doubt it. I, I actually think Lovecraft was one of the least spiritual people I, I I know of. Which doesn't mean that he, you know, he had great appreciation for literature and art, and maybe not so much music. He claimed he didn't really have, uh, you know, uh, understanding of music. But uh, he was, you know, tremendously affected by art. And, and things like that. And, and in fact, he, I, I can find you a great quotation. He, he, um, when he was talking about the belief in immortality, which, of course, he didn't believe in, and, you know, he says that's, uh, you don't need that to have a fulfilling life. And, and one of the things he says was, uh, let's see if I can find this quickly. Um, well, most people don't want to believe that. That's the thing. They don't want to believe that this is the only life they're going to get when it's over. They turn to worm food. That's it. Done. This is it. Yeah. And it scares yeah. people to death. So it's almost like I'd rather not think about it. I think a lot of that has to do with religion, too, though. Oh, absolutely. I mean, Lovecraft was convinced that religion survives largely because of the fear of death and because of basically childhood brainwashing. And I'm afraid to say I, I agree with him on that point. But he says, you know, he said something like, you know, it's easy to let the mind, you know, to free the mind from fear of death. You know, he says, uh, the, ta- the consolations of taste and intellect are infinite. I mean, there's so much to appreciate uh, on Earth, you know, in our lives. I mean, you don't really need anything more beyond that, because you're not going to be around, frankly, and you're, you're, you're not going to be conscious, you know, and that's, that's it. So just make the most of what you have here. That's interesting. You got any thoughts on that, Eric? You're the scientist. Well, <laughs> Yeah, and yeah, the scientists are the foot in both worlds. Uh, I can see Lovecraft's point. If you believe, you know, deep down the core of your being that it's one and done, what is the horror of death other than you don't get to experience life anymore? Because his idea is once the final curtain closes, you are oblivious to your nature. And to him, I guess that was a comfort in that, you know, there's no more, yeah, sure, I'm not going to see all this art, I'm not going to write these stories, but I'm also not going to suffer, I'm not going to be plagued by my past. There's a sense of, of peace, almost, in that one-and-done philosophy of his. I think that has, I think you're right, and I think um, this is something, I've been perfectly honest with my audience about this. This is something that I think about, too, you know. Now, yes, I am a spiritual person, but there's always that, that thought in the back of my mind, what if what if my mind is doing all this, that out-of-body experience I had, the, the dreams that I've had, what if that is really just, maybe the mind is just so powerful we just don't know it? And, uh, you know, that comes down to the whole DMT thing, but I don't want to get too far into the science here. Uh, but I think a lot of people are afraid to admit their fears about that. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's actually, um, there, he, in one of his stories, actually, Lovecraft addresses this point where, in fact, the story is called Ex Oblivione, which means from oblivion. It's a guy, apparently a story about a person writing from from the state of oblivion. And he says, you know, and he's reached that stage, and he says, so happier than I had ever hoped to be, I dissolved again into that native infinity of crystal oblivion from mm-hmm. which the demon life had called me for one brief and desolate hour. <laughs> well, man, not not very cheerful, but um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know. He says, "Well, you know, in oblivion, there is no wish unfulfilled because you're not around to to, to wish for anything." So, uh, whatever. Um, and I'm convinced that he was sincere in that belief, and 
you know, I mean, he, you know, he didn't have any sort of deathbed con- conversion as far as, as far as we know. I mean, people came. There were there are people we know that that actually saw him the day before he died, and he was, you know, he was just stoic about it and realized that he was going to die, and that was it. Yeah, it's a subject that I'm glad you're here to talk about too, with because I've talked to Eric privately about this and with other people. Uh, we don't express that thought or that idea that, um, you know, there may not be a life after death. And I've said it time and time again, and you guys know this, all of these people that they want to go to the the fifth dimension, the fourth dimension, and all these other places that are so much better than life, when maybe, just maybe, and I'm just saying maybe here, okay, guys, <laughs> that life is the best thing in this universe, that it's actually one of the greatest things and when you should cherish it while you have it no matter how bad the suffering oh i can i can tell you i i you know i mean i, I wake up thrilled every day that i'm alive i mean because i know that <laughs> I, I personally am convinced this is the only chance i have and i'm going to make the most of it i get that i totally get that guys we'll be right back we've got to take another short break we're here with author uh we're here with the author st joshi and we're also here with my partner eric markham Put your questions in caps if you have them in the chat room, and we'll be right back. How you doing today, guys? This is Garrett Lee. And this is Randy Warner. We're the hosts of Healers and Hellraisers, and you're listening to The Fringe FM. Hi, this is Sammy. Join us in the Deep South as we're lighting the void with Joe Roop on The Fringe FM. Live for three hours every Saturday night. It's a show that engages the mind, makes you think, and maybe even challenge what you think you know. Hi, I'm Jeremy Scott of Into the Parabnormal, where we talk about topics that are anything but mainstream, somewhere between abnormal and paranormal. Bring an open mind and join us for Into the Parabnormal. Live Saturdays at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern on The Fringe FM. From birth, we have been conditioned to conform to what is normal, conditioned to adhere to authority, and conditioned to repeat what has been told to us as truth. I'm Ryan Gable, and here at The Secret Teachings Radio, I've interviewed hundreds of great guests and done extensive unique research into subjects that span from the paranormal and the occult to health, philosophy, and history. I personally have no affiliations or agenda, except to use objective critical thinking in my analysis of every subject discussed to empower myself with information and hopefully allow you to do the same. If you want to join me, tune into the Secret Teachings radio broadcast airing live Monday through Friday from midnight to 3 a.m. U.S. Pacific Standard Time on the Fringe FM. For more information, you can visit our website at www.thesecretteachings.info or email me at rdgable at yahoo.com. Reclaim your active lifestyle with Angioprim. Angioprim is the original liquid oral chelation supplement. Chelation helps remove toxins, heavy metals, and cholesterol in your veins and arteries that can cause blockages. Scientific research proves the active ingredient in Angioprim has superior oral chelation action that helps promote cardiovascular health. Find out more. Go to angioprim.com. Talk to a trained consultant by calling Angioprim toll-free, 877-882-7221. Hey, it's Grace. Can we talk about something serious for a minute? Your age. Getting old has its perks. But remember, being a few years younger, you know, your hair was thicker, you didn't have so many wrinkles, that extra weight wasn't haunting you, and you just felt better. Well, we can't turn back the clocks and go back 10 or 15 years, but you can start feeling and looking 10 or 15 years younger with Nature's Youth RSF. It's a doctor-formulated daily supplement that helps your body maintain its peak performance and fight the aging process. Imagine sleeping better, looking better, and feeling better. See how Nature's Youth RSF has helped thousands of people just like you at naturesyouth.com. Naturesyouth.com. 
Imagine how it will feel when your family and friends are asking you what you did to look so good. Your secret will be Nature's Youth RSF. It's time to start looking better and feeling better. Learn more and order your Nature's Youth RSF at naturesyouth.com. That's naturesyouth.com. That's naturesyouth.com. So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. Want to know what's on the Fringe FM? Check out our schedule at thefringe.fm. Hey, Fringe FM listeners. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or no Wi-Fi available, you can still listen to every minute of the Fringe FM by calling 701-719-3971. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. Saves your data plan and no extra cost if you have unlimited minutes. Call 701-719-3971. That's 701-719-3971. Listen to the Fringe FM on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Welcome back to Lighting the Void. I'm your host, Joe Roop, and tonight we're talking about HP Lovecraft. Uh, I haven't really talked about the Necronomicon yet, but I will bring that up. We're here with author S.T. Joshi and my partner in crime, Eric Markham. And uh, I can already tell my last statements of belief or not knowing about life after death kind of stirred up a little bit, stirred up some stuff just a little bit. But knowing and belief are two different things. Remember that. What I believe... In, and you guys know what I believe in, but it doesn't mean, and here's the important thing, it doesn't mean that I won't hear out the other side's point of view. To me, that is so important. We should always do that. Just because we believe so, something doesn't mean that we have to shut out other people's points of view, because you might learn something, actually, when you do things like that. But here's a, a question that I kind of want to start this with. The Necronomicon. Now, I don't know how familiar you are with that, uh, Mr. Joshi, but to, in my world, it's a big, big thing in the occult world, and it's kind of freaky why occultists call themselves spiritualists, and yet they're attracted, for the most part, to fiction. All of them are attracted to fiction and dark characters. Do you see where I'm going with this? It just, yeah, well. It's, it's all there. Well, in that sense, the Necronomicon is a kind of anti-Bible. I mean, you know, it, it, it's, it's funny. It's not clear really what Lovecraft meant by the Necronomicon. And, and I think his views changed over the course of his writing career. It became one thing at one point, and then maybe something else at another point. But um, um, I think what he was trying to get at is, he, he was since he was himself such a, a reader. I mean, he was reading from the age of two onward, you know, at least from the age of four. He had developed this sense that books have the answers, that, that whatever he doesn't know about the universe, it's there in a book somewhere. And so that created the notion of forbidden knowledge, that there are some books that have information that is dangerous to know, that it, that would, you know, be be it literally hazardous to our health, and it, it it undermines our whole reason for existing, and that's what I think led him to create the Necronomicon and other books of that same sort. Okay, what do you do? You got any comments on that, Eric? Because you've brought the Necronomicon up to me quite a few times. Well, yeah, I've, I've actually tried to wade through it. It was oh, how put dare together. You. What we know as the Necronomicon was actually put together by people that were fans of H.P. Lovecraft. H.P. Lovecraft never wrote the Necronomicon. He only referred to it and the author, the mad Arab uh, Abdul al Hazred, who, if I remember right, was driven mad by the knowledge and was torn to 
pieces by demons in the streets of Baghdad. <laughs> but, you know, H.P. Lovecraft never, he referred to that as a literary device when his character was looking for what he called eldritch knowledge, you know. What is that? The Arkham universe. Well, it's just that that hidden occult knowledge is just so dangerous that it's just not, you know, it's not yeah, widely so that, that's available. That's what I was getting at. There's in, only in that some, one source. In, because in some stories, it seems as if al is uh, just coming up with a book of spells, you know, to summon up these demons or the old ones, as he called them. That's, that's what seems to be going on in, say, the Dunwich Horror. But in other stories, it seems as if al is warning people away from these monster so it's it's not clear what Lovecraft's conception really was or that it changed over time well, it was sort of his, anyway, what, army what, knife what, literary what, device depending on right <laughs> i mean what book there are, at least, there are at least four or five books that now call themselves the necronomicon and some of them are just f- hoaxes or you know joke books the other was others apparently are quite serious this guy simon apparently wrote a very serious treatise and he tried to come up with spells and things like that uh, so i don't know what you're referring to in terms of the the actual Necronomicon or whatever. Right, because they believe that there's there was... a real Necronomicon. I, I even got a ta- I went on a show as a guest to uh, Gry America to talk about the original ceremonial magic that the Golden Dawn created, more like Renaissance magic stuff, Kelly and all that. And I got attacked in the chat room a little bit. Well, if you're going to study magic, then you should definitely study sigils and the Necronomicon, or you don't know what you're talking about. And I'm like, isn't the Necronomicon <laughs> science fiction? Like, I thought it was... <laughs> fiction you know yep. so it's just really i'm trying to understand all this what the fascination is not not of lovecraft but a cultist with the necronomicon and I'm, I'm starting to learn based on what you guys are telling me here well yeah i mean obviously not i don't know a lot about occultism but there's certainly a long tradition of of you know kind of secret books that that contain this this kind of knowledge and it goes all the way back well possibly to antiquity if you want to think of it that way um, but certainly people like, uh, you know, John Dee and, and all kinds of others who, or, or you know, wrote these books. You know, some of them are around, some of them are not around, uh, that, that contain the, you know, the secrets of the universe. It was sort of his all-purpose uh, grimoire of the, the dark arts was the Necronomicon. I mean, you were always, in his stories, you were always desperate for an answer. Like you were saying, he felt that a book, you know, there was an answer to everything in books, but you were at the end of your tether and willing to give up your soul to open the pages of the Necronomicon. Really? That bad, and huh? It, and it never and, and really, you know, well, you never, it never ended well for the person. I don't think there's anybody who had contact with that book. It was sorry if the Necronomicon appears in an H.P. Lovecraft story, the protagonist is, you know, you can just about write it up nine out of ten times, that protagonist is going to end badly. Whether they're going to be insane, whether they're right. going to be consumed by dark forces or what, something bad happens whenever the Necronomicon comes up. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Lovecraft was wise in not actually quoting the text of the Necronomicon, except in one or two different stories. The most, the lengthiest one, of course, we have is in the Dunwich Horror, and that's where Wilbur Waitley, you know, from, from Dunwich, tries to uh, go into the Miskatonic University Library and steal the copy of the, the complete Necronomicon, because he doesn't have a complete edition. Uh, and, yeah, it certainly ends badly for him. But we do have a fairly long quotation there, which kind of reads... Uh, like a mixture of <laughs> Nietzsche and and the King James Bible and Dunsany and it kind of thing is very uh, oracular and and kind of not entirely comprehensible. But that's the whole point of it. You know, you don't want to just spell things out. You want to kind of hint at things and 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 suggest more than just state. I mean, from a psychological point of view, make- it seems to me like you know how how people say, "Well, you're just looking for God. You're just trying to validate your beliefs." Uh, by reading this book or this or that, but it kind of seems the opposite with the Necronomicon based on what I've seen, where people are trying to validate the devil and Satan and the dark demons, you know, and it's, I I don't know. It just seems like it was originally a work of fiction, right? I mean, that's what it was. Well, you know, Lovecraft himself was was asked, you know, 
oh, will you ever write the Necronomicon? I said, no, I mean, why should I? Uh, you know, because it's so much better to hint at things instead of, and, and just, rather than just coming out with it. And anyway, in, in, in the Donovan Charter, he cites a text from page 751, so it, it was a pretty big book, apparently, so, uh, and yeah. none of the published Necronomicons are quite that big, so that's a problem, but, um, uh, it's much better to, to, you know, to keep it in the background and just, just allude to it rather than, you know, bring it out. Well, you're doing a lot of editing, too, If and I'm not trying to to figure out what's wrong with anybody else's books, but what do you, what, mostly, there's a lot of people that write about Lovecraft, and what do you think's the one of the biggest things that, that maybe they got wrong about Lovecraft? Well, I, as I say, I think... They take the fiction too seriously. In the and not that it's not serious. I mean, not that it's you know just frivolous writing that that didn't mean anything to Lovecraft. But they take it as gospel, as as something that that you know that that Lovecraft is stating fact that he's stating his you know beliefs straight out. Mm. Uh, the the relation between Lovecraft's beliefs and his fiction is very complicated and requires a lot of background research in terms of his actual beliefs, which we find in his letters or essays or whatnot. And then you can sort of see how he reflects those beliefs in his fiction, but it's on a very deep level and a very symbolic level. I think Eric was saying that as well. That, uh, and, and it's not straightforward. So that's, that's a key mistake that people make. Well, I think I might actually start to get into it a little bit. I, Cause if I'm a, f- Look, I've got friends, they say, oh, if you get into Lovecraft, you're going to get into that cult. And, uh, you know, I've got this thing, even though I'm an occultist, <laughs> which don't make sense, i got this thing uh-huh. against cult mentalities, right? Uh-huh. Uh, I like to keep an open mind, and I don't want to get lost in it. But, man, it just, I mean, it wouldn't affect so many people. And, by the way, the people that I talk to that are really into Lovecraft seem like super intelligent people. That's what makes me attracted to it and want to read it more. Well, uh, the greatness of Lovecraft, he appeals to people of all different levels, you know, and, and backgrounds. That's, that's, again, I think it's a testimonial, you know, you know to, to his, his greatness as a writer. I mean, that is one of the hallmarks of literature is that it appeals to many different levels, and you can read it in many different ways, and you, you get more out of it each time you read it. And I know that's been the case for me. All right, what was you going to say, Eric? Well, I think one of the things about Lovecraft that, that people might not understand as they're reading it. He never really describes the horror. He leaves a, he hints at it. He gives you an outline for your imagination to run with. And I think that's one of the draws to Lovecraft is he ta- allows you to tap into your own source of horror. I mean, there's a vague description of Cthulhu, but then when you imagine this octopus dragon man thing coming out of the, the waters to reclaim his throne on earth, your own mind fills in the blanks that Lovecraft supplied. All of his main creatures, it seems like when he's writing, the, they are so horrible that they are beyond his ability, you know, the, his ability to put down on paper. He writes it that way, you know, you're encountering this being that is so horrible that your own mind would rather go into madness and oblivion than comprehend what you're looking at. And I think he was a master at setting that up. You know, people accuse him of using purple prose and for that era, yeah, it was, you know, it was very purple. It was very Baroque and full of flourishes. But it was effective in that it opened up a doorway. It was almost like he gave you permission to scare yourself. You know, um, another thing I'm interested in, too, Mr. Joshi, am I saying your name right? Because if I'm yes, saying it you, wrong. you are, mercifully enough. So many people say it wrong as Joshi, but it definitely is Joshi. Okay, and you, so you were born in India, correct? That's correct. And... Um, is Lovecraft even a thing in India? I mean, I, I, I hear about it in the United States, but the, in the Eastern world, I don't know how something like that is viewed at all. Do you? Well, you know, I left India when I was five and really haven't been back. I was only back, back once uh, since okay. then. Um, a lot of Indians, of course, you know, the educated Indians uh, speak English pretty well, or at least know English, you know, and they can read it well, well. Um, and yet they're like, how many, how many, 17 languages in India? We 
we think <laughs> there's exactly one edition of Lovecraft in the language called Bengali, which is spoken in, in Calcutta, uh, but I haven't found it. I mean, I saw a citation of it, but it never, it never turned it up, um, which is strange, I have to confess. I'm surprised that Lovecraft isn't in Hindi or Marathi or, Beng, you know, other this, uh, other, other, other languages, uh, but we don't know of any. Uh, I think a lot of Indians read it in, in English. Um, nevertheless, uh, Lovecraft is huge in Japan, and now we have, we have definitely found Chinese editions, um, and of course, all the European languages. He's, he's huge in South America. He's also enormous. Uh, Spanish, Portuguese uh, translations are just beyond number. Did your parents? I mean, you were brought over here uh, in what the fifties, right? Uh, uh, late early sixties. Early sixties. Okay, and then you settled in Illinois. You you come from an intelligent family. I mean, your parents uh, were professors of economics and mathematics. That's what I'm saying, man. Like the. Yep. You know, good brains here. Did your parents? Well, I ever... think a lot, a lot of immigrants, at least at that time, you know, the well-educated came over here for you know to pursue you know economic, sure. uh, uh, you know, positions, things like that. The more than we could do it uh, in our homes. So, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I you know, we, there were always books in the house. Although my my parents certainly didn't emphasize the horror thing. They, That's they, what I was going to ask that. you. What did they think um, about it? I, I uh, well, I think they were curious that I was reading this kind of stuff, but uh, um, they were just glad I was reading. You know, I mean, it's um, uh, and I read other things too. I read, uh, I read mainstream fiction. I read a lot of history. I was fascinated with history at uh, one point. Uh, still am to some degree. Um, never read much of the sciences, and I and I didn't take many science courses. And I regret that because actually that would help me understand Lovecraft better because he was really pretty well versed in science, but. Um, uh, no, I just I just couldn't stop reading. I mean, I just read and read and read. I read a lot of detective stories too, which are kind of fluff. But uh, still, it was uh, you know it all went into eventually what I what I did, wanted to be as a writer. So that it all worked out for the best. And so when you turned seventeen, that's when you decided to be a literary critic, right? Because things. You know, right, because I, I just wasn't getting anywhere as a fiction right. writer. But you know, I mean, I mean, what do you expect when you're a kid? But uh, I just felt that I didn't have anything to say as a write, as a fiction writer. I felt that I was just imitating Lovecraft or other writers that I had read. So it, it didn't, it wasn't, you know, anything of my own. And, and but turning to literary criticism, I felt I had something to say. And you know, and then when I got to college at Brown, I went to Brown. You know. Because Lovecraft, you know, lived in Providence, Rhode Island, and Brown was right there, and 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 all his papers were there, a lot of them anyway. And I wanted to study Lovecraft. Um, I mean, I did I did my coursework as well, but uh, uh, any time I wasn't in <laughs> in a class, I was over there at the library looking at these Lovecraft manuscripts, and and I learned so much there. I mean, I couldn't have done all the stuff I've done since then without you know that time I spent with with the Lovecraft material there. Do you think that you heavily influenced? works that a lot of people didn't know about i mean um i mean because it says you know your biography says i began unearthing dozens of works by lovecraft that had not been known or reprinted so oh the, 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 there were so many things i mean you know no almost no fiction of course I and mean, we knew most you know almost all the fiction that he'd written i did discover a few cases where he had uh helped other writers you know, revise or ghostwrite their stuff you know a few stories like that uh, but mostly what I discovered there uh, at Brown University was all these essays and poetry, and of course, thousands and thousands of letters. And I'm still in the process of editing these letters and trying to get them published now. Uh, and every single letter is a revelation, because Lovecraft, you know, you think of him as this kind of straight-laced New Englander, you know, keeping things very close to the chest, but man, he he really opens himself up in these letters and tells you so much about himself. I mean, it's amazing. Um, and so... It's through those letters that I really got to understand Lovecraft, and that's why I want to get them out into the world. I, mean, I think it's every writer's dream to get that contract, you know? Like that contract, instead of trying to push their book and hope it sells and stuff, but just to get a contract to write. Do you remember when that happened and how it felt? Oh, I was just flabbergasted. Yeah, I, I had a, my, the first, my first real book was this attempt. I was trying to assemble a volume of Lovecraft criticism, you know, some stuff written before, you know, from the 30s, 40s, 50s, uh, other stuff that had been written, you know, recently that I had asked people to write. 
and I shopped it around to various academic presses, you know. And remember, I was an undergraduate. I mean, the undergraduates just didn't do that kind of stuff, you know. I mean, you know, only professors, you know, got books published by academic uh, institutions. Uh, and I shopped it around like 30 different publishers. And finally, all of a sudden, Ohio, Ohio University Press said, okay, we'll do this book. And I was just, I was, I was totally flabbergasted. You know, I was 20 years old, and uh, they kept calling me professor because they assumed I was a professor. But, uh, I, you know, once I signed the contract, I said, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just an undergraduate. You don't have to call me professor anymore. So uh, that was pretty funny. Really? That's funny because I've had people on the show that have actually said, and Eric can tell you, there's some people we've contacted that are quite snooty. <laughs> and they want to be called officially doctor or this, that, or some people want to be paid. And I'm like, you know, look, I've had some big writers on here, man, Whitley Strieber, Robert Shock. You know, I don't, if I didn't, they didn't ask me for money, so I'm not paying you. And it kind of insulted me. But somebody yeah. that, as, dude, you've got an, a really extensive writing background and you're awfully humble about it. And you don't run into that a lot. A matter of well, fact, I'm, I'm looking just at your doing history, what I want to do, you know, I mean, I, 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 I really lived a, privileged life and i've i've been i've helped been helped by a lot of people whether it's my wife or my mother or, you know they've they've been very supportive of me and i mean you know it's not as if i make a, a ton of money at this stuff but i managed to get by and i basically able to do this you know all day long i don't have to have another job which is a mercy because i couldn't have done all the stuff i did if i if i had to uh, to work at, you know work at some other job now, obviously, uh, you know, I don't want to stay on this one subject, but I do have to ask about, you know, because you've written about atheism, and it's, it's. I've always wanted to be able to talk to somebody that, you know, with a background like yours about this, to tell me their side. Not a, not like a debate, not a, uh, you know, an argument, but that's what it always turns into. I've been on YouTube looking at these debates and all that, and I'm like, this is crazy. Why can't yeah. these people just talk? As normal human beings, I mean, you know that the beliefs I have are just beliefs. You know that. Uh, mm-hmm. Did you ever? Were you, was your family spiritual? Were you grown? Did were you raised in a spiritual house, or was it always? Just my, my mother is, very, and to this day, she is ninety-one years old, almost ninety-one. Wow, uh, quite quite spiritual. Yeah, I mean, she was raised as a Hindu and still believes a lot of the Hindu doctrine. Not all of it, but. Uh, uh, I think she's she's wavering on the on the reincarnation business, but uh, um, you know she's she's quite devout, and uh, you know, but but my father was secular. He said, you know, he he said he would prefer that I and my two sisters not be indoctrinated into Hinduism or any other religion for that matter, um, and that we should be allowed to make up our own minds uh, when you know when we were ready to do so. Uh, now, did that? incline me toward atheism i'm not entirely no. sure that it did i mean i was not prevented from believing in any religion that i wanted to believe in but um i as i started exploring this issue i just felt that the likelihood of any religion being true and you know there, there are hundreds if not thousands of religions on this earth you know whether from the past or the present it just struck me that none of them really were very convincing, uh, especially in terms of what we now know about the universe in terms of, of, of science and uh, especially the sciences of biology and physics and things. I mean, it just makes it, to me, highly unlikely that any specific religion uh, could possibly be true. Yeah, and we have a lot of people that listen to the show that are, they're not, they say, you know, I'm not religious, kind of like me, but uh, for some reason I do believe in in the spirit. And that's based on my experiences. I know we have a listener named Sammy who had an awful experience when she was a child and had a near-death experience. But, again, I'll have to say sometimes I wonder just how powerful the mind is. You know what I mean? Like, is oh, that absolutely. just the brain doing that? Sure. Right? I think that, I think, I mean, the more we learn about both the universe and about the human mind and the human body, I think the less likelihood that there is that there can be any sort of uh, uh, continuation of our of ourselves after death, uh, or the uh, the existence of, of of any sort of deity, it just struck me as as so unlikely that that it seems hardly worth worth considering. And and you know too, a big case in my opinion for atheism as well. And I'm not an atheist. I don't, but. Well, I guess you could say I'm a spiritualist, but a big case for this is the account of, well, when I went to college, I found out that I thought Judaism was the oldest religion, but I found out actually it was Hinduism. 
According, uh, yes. that's what was taught to me in college, and I was like, "Really? Hinduism is the oldest religion." Well, here's this is a caste system of gods, you know. Uh, yep. So I was thinking that's very interesting, and I know religion influenced the the religion after, and then when you look at to like. Judeo-Christian religions, it's all based around the setting and rising of the sun. I mean, it's obvious once you really study it. So, and I think, in my opinion, that this is something that, uh, you know, they tried to show us in a lot of movies. You guys brought up earlier Space Odyssey. That whole movie was kind of showing us how evolution really fast, technology in a really fast way, you know, and that's exactly what's happening right now i mean artificial intelligence is starting to work its way into things and i don't know i i'm not upset about it in my opinion and people are going to get upset about this uh, mr Josie, when i say this but if i find out after i die that there's nothing there it probably won't be that bad because i'm not going to care anyways right right. you're not going to be around it it doesn't matter yeah well what lovecraft maintained, you know, he grew up, remember, late 19th century into the early 20th century. This was exactly the time when a lot of anthropologists were kind of studying the origin of religion. How does a religion start? I mean, how does, and how does it develop? Uh, you had scholars like, you know, James George Frazier, who wrote The Golden Bow, you wrote a mm-hmm. number of other other uh, writers of that kind, who, who, who studied the de- the natural development of religion, which had nothing to do with you know a uh, god. I mean, it's just it's it's how human beings, you know, interpreted their place in the universe. Uh, and there were you know, it seemed as if primitive man had no way of understanding his place in the universe except by appealing to either multiple gods or eventually a single god, because he couldn't understand natural phenomena in any other fashion and that that accounting which i think is still sound of of how religion developed is very important and it was important to lovecraft to uh, to to you know foster his atheism well the 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 beauty of it is is uh, i mean what i believe and i won't go into my beliefs but what i believe is even atheists are going to be welcomed after life you know there's this whole idea of hell that's just insane it's insane Yes. I mean, come on, folks. Really. It's insane to believe that somebody loves you more than your parents, but will punish you more than Hitler himself. And and punish you for eternal, eternally. Yeah, exactly. Not just burn you once, but just forever and ever because you didn't love them back. That's insane, folks. And, uh, I mean, you the title that you wrote, God's Defenders, What They Believe, and and why, why they, they are, are wrong. wrong? That's a pretty stout title to put on a book, you yeah. know. My, even my publisher, which is a major free thought publisher, you know, Prometheus Books, was a little a little scared of that title of that subtitle, but I insisted on keeping it. So Prometheus isn't didn't uh, isn't it Alan Moore? Am I thinking wrong uh, right here? No, I don't different. think so. I was thinking comic books for some reason. Yeah, uh, yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah. We're past the break. We got to go into our break, guys. We got one more segment with Mr. Joshi. We'll be right back, guys. Don't go anywhere. I'm Joe Roop. This is Lighting the Void. Listening to Lighting the Void Radio. This is Rev. Dan Lopez from Spiritual Warrior Today Radio, and you're listening to KTLK, The Fringe FM. Hi there, Gigi here. And I'm Cortana, and we're here to take you on a journey through all things paranormal, metaphysical, ufology, and even psychedelic on our show. Shift Happens, live every Friday night from 7 to 9 Pacific, that's 9 to 11 Central, right here on The Fringe FM. And remember, don't feed the Archons, feed ducks instead. Duck up. Occult Arcana is a balanced and objective guide to those subjects considered a part of the nature of light and darkness. Addressed in this text is a compilation of material 
that will provide new perspectives and awaken latent abilities that we all possess. The content herein shall provide magical sustenance for adept and novice alike, and will help strengthen the cornerstone of mystic understanding and alchemical transmutation. If you are interested in this modern grimoire, you can find detailed information and ways to order by visiting www.thesecretteachings.info. Although esoteric and occult studies remain vast, they are rooted within a universal philosophy that is difficult, if not impossible by finite terms, to explain in words. Language places restriction and erects barriers to understandings. By this it is to be understood that there are some things man should consider far too sacred to profane with definition. For these concepts and the manner by which we live our lives, we shall take a note from the Greek philosopher Pythagoras, quote, Silence is better than unmeaning words, end quote. To get your autographed copy of Occult Arcana today, simply visit www.thesecretteachings.info or email The Secret Teachings at rdgable at yahoo.com. Follow The Fringe FM on Facebook and Twitter at The Fringe FM. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? you love the new Paranormal Radio app from TalkStream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in Paranormal Talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now. The Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. Who were the real ancient Egyptians? What is it about ancient Egypt that captivates us all? The critically acclaimed series Magical Egypt is back with all new episodes. Let Chance Gardner and company take you on another adventure through Magical Egypt in the new series Magical Egypt 2. Magical Egypt 2 attempts a forensic reconstruction of the science of the ancients through a study of ancient aesthetics. Also, the best researchers and authors in the field like John Anthony West, Graham Hancock, Laird Scranton, Robert Bouval, Lon Mao Duquette, Aaron Cheek and more join together to explore the topics of the esoteric and the hidden messages of the ancient Egyptians. Just go to MagicalEgypt.com right now and put in the code word FRINGE and get 10% off any download or order including the groundbreaking original Magical Egypt series as well as the new episodes in Magical Egypt 2. Also check out the great work and the companion series at MagicalEgypt.com. Click the banner on the Fringe FM or go to MagicalEgypt.com and use the code word FRINGE and get 10% off your order today while it lasts. So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. Does your basement or crawl space have a damp, musty smell? Well, watch out. That's a sign of too much moisture and not enough ventilation. And that can mean increased mold growth and the buildup of harmful toxins and gases. Don't bother with a dehumidifier. It just circulates the same unhealthy air. Now there's a better way to remove these dangers and odors. It's with the computerized Wave Moisture Control Unit that reduces moisture and expels pollutants. We replaced our old dehumidifier with the Wave Unit, and in only three weeks, our basement is dry and the musty smell smell is gone. Wave units require no maintenance, no buckets of water or filters, and costs only pennies a day to run. Breathe better, live healthier with an affordable, no maintenance Wave unit. Call 888-717-WAVE 888-717-WAVE or visit dryhealthyhome.com dryhealthyhome.com Ride the wave Wave home solutions for a healthy comfortable home If you have hard water, the lime scale not only leaves white spots, it clogs pipes and breaks down appliances, costing you hundreds of dollars in energy and wear. Eliminate lime scale and other water issues like brown staining and bad odors with HydroCare water products available from Wave Home Solutions. Wave's affordable water systems don't use salts or chemicals. You'll love the way your water tastes, smells, and looks. Satisfaction guaranteed. For more information, go to bestwater123.com. That's bestwater123.com. Times are changing. The circus of politics, healthcare's low standards and high prices, and let's not forget food quality. What to do? Arm yourself with life change tea at getthetea.com. In a world of chemical imbalance, 
and poor air and water quality, it's time you make a move. Log on to GetTheTea.com and stock up on organic non-GMO supplements. Don't forget the tea. Cleansing your body never felt so good. And we have a brand new tea called Take Down Tea, which helps support healthy glucose. All natural body support so you can be at your best naturally. All you have to do is log on to GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. We're not a fad that comes and goes. We are the real deal. Join us and armor up. GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. Changing America's health one tea bag at a time. Welcome back to Lighting the Void. We are speaking with author S.T. Joshi. Fascinating guy. Website is stjoshi.org. I'm going to have all of that in the show notes for you to go check it out. And as I was telling him during the break, you know, I had to cut the biography off just a little. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of writings here, a lot of uh, past life, I mean, that he's had into this. It's very impressive, by the way. I'm not just trying to blow smoke. It's, it's very impressive. Um, one of the things that I, I, I did want to uh, just touch on, and I'll leave it alone after this, is... Um, you know, atheism isn't something... I think some people have said it's the fastest growing religion. I actually got a message that says it's the fastest growing religion right now. Now, if, if you're a spiritualist or you believe in spirit like I do, that should concern you because there's a lot of validation in there as to why it's the fastest growing religion. And uh, until we come up with something substantial, not circumstantial, but it would be nice to come up with something substantial i mean wouldn't you agree mr Josh? i mean if we had something substantial in your mind maybe there would actually be a good argument there but it's not there's nothing substantial well i think to if there was something to be discovered we would have discovered it by now i mean really religion has been around for you know we're, we have to go even way beyond hinduism i mean the earliest human religion uh, if we want to call that is what is called animism uh, which is uh, again go back to primitive times where people you know thought that you know uh, trees and rivers and everything out there was animated by some something or other I mean, if a river flows downstream then it must be being pushed by some some river god or something like that if a tree grows it must be being you know grows because some god is ordering it to grow like that um, and those types of, of, of beliefs eventually led to either polytheism as in Hinduism or monotheism as in you know Hinduism and or, or in, uh, Judaism Christianity Islam uh, I think if there's any truth to religion, we would have found it by now. And, and the fact that a lot of people are now sloughing off religion uh, kind of tells you something about where we are and, 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 and some of the downsides of religion. Uh, I mean, religion has caused a lot of harm throughout civilization, and I think people are starting to latch on to that. Well, Dennis Koch makes a good point in the chat room, right? And so does Lily. Atheism is anti-religion because I just called it a religion. But some people are saying... It is a religion. It's a fast-growing religion. Well, it's kind of yeah. maybe it is. Maybe yeah. Not. I mean, I personally, I mean, it's it's the negation of religion, but it's hard to classify it otherwise. I mean, some people do believe in atheism as if it were a religion. I mean, they are they are so invested in it that they can't, you know, they 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 adopt a, a religious mindset even when they're atheists, and I think that's a bad idea. My atheism is. I wouldn't say provisional because I'm pretty convinced that I'm, you know, that, that atheism is right. But again, I'm always open to evidence, and you have to be whatever belief you have, and and, and that's that's you know that's really the only way to approach things. Right, and just like Dennis said, what's wrong with atheism? So what? I mean, what's the big deal? What does it matter to anybody besides you? Well, some you know, people are very threatened by it, and you can understand why, because, I mean, for the longest time, atheism was actually, you know, it was a criminal offense in many European uh, uh, nations, you know, throughout history, because it was, you know, because of these uh, nations had an established church, you know, England still has an established church, technically, but um, and, you know, not believing in that church was, was regarded as, as almost treasonous and, and certainly blasphemous, and you know when religion, when religious authority was was at its height, you know in the Middle Ages into the Renaissance. I mean, it was it was a very dangerous thing to be an atheist, um, and that that whiff of danger still 
still lingers today. And, and you know, I'm going to touch on something that might offend people, and then we're going to move along here. But what what would make you, let's just say, for instance, you're right. And this is from a Judeo-Christian point of view. Let's say you're right. Let's say there is a man in the sky that judges everything you do. Okay? And then if you don't love him correctly, if you don't accept him correctly, you're going to be punished for eternity in the worst way ever. Now, let's say that God was real. He came down here and, ta- and said, I'm real. I would, would you really still want to worship that person? I would think there would be a revolution against somebody like that. Yeah, I mean, that is, that is not uh, a kind of God I would care to worship, let's be honest. Um, but there you are. I mean, you know, and I mean, let's be honest, Christ, Christian belief has itself go, undergone all kinds of modifications over the centuries, uh, in part because of atheists and in part because of the advance of science, and they've been basically forced to give up a lot of the you know, beliefs that, they, that they've had, even though those beliefs are right in the Bible. I mean, right. if I may be frank, the Bible actually advocates things like death to homosexuals, uh, death to unbelievers, uh, you know, and, and uh, apparently believes that the earth is flat, that, uh, that uh, you know, the sun revolves around the earth. Um, most Christians don't believe these things anymore, but unfortunately they are still in the Bible, so you kind of have to do some fancy footwork to, uh, you know, <laughs> figure out how to, how to get away from that. But um, Yeah, and I mean, it was written by men, it was in pretty much, most people know, especially the New Testament was written in a Greek time, there's some hidden stuff in there. I, I actually think if uh, this rabbi named Yeshua was there, that it was something totally different than what they're being taught anyway. So uh, somebody in the chat, Liz, actually, or, is wants to know what your definition of atheism is. Uh, okay. Um, well, I don't know if we've read Richard Dawkins's, uh, you know, The God Delusion. He defines uh, different grades of atheism, you know, from strong atheism to weak, weak atheism. I mean, strong atheism means absolutely convinced of everything, you know, that atheism is absolutely right and nothing else can possibly be right. And weak atheism, which is like kind of like, all right, I'm kind of an atheist, but, you know, maybe not. You know, I'm sort of in the middle ground there. My atheism is basically saying that so far as I can understand you know, the universe in terms of, you know, what we know about science and, and other things like that. I do not have any sufficient evidence to believe in God. If there is such evidence, I will believe in it, but I think that evidence is very unlikely to emerge. So that's, that's my atheism. How many projects are you working on at once, by the way, if you don't mind me asking, as far as writing goes? Oh. So many. I mean, it, it's hard to say. I'm and I, I'm not actually. I don't do actually write uh, a lot of books. I'm mostly what I do is edit books. Uh, but that that's not so easy either. You know. Uh, I mean, uh, I mentioned this ongoing project of editing all of Lovecraft's letters, uh, and there are thousands and thousands of letters, and the, the, this to- this series is going to be a, a total of twenty five volumes, and we've done about nine, ten, eleven so far, I think. Uh, and a number of these other ones are in the works, and they'll come out, you know, one by one. Um, I, I'm, I also want to do a lot of more work on, on uh, Ambrose Bierce, who's a fascinating writer, and a lot of his work is still not out there, especially the journalism that he wrote back in the 19th century. That's fascinating stuff. And another great journalist, you mentioned him, although, <clears throat> I'm sorry to say you mispronounced his name, but H.L. Mencken, the great journalist from That's Baltimore. Right. I did bash, I totally screwed that name up, I'm sorry. Okay, no problem, but he was, he's still a great writer, I mean, he's, uh, and, and he still has a, a high reputation, I mean, uh, uh, wrote for the Baltimore Sun for, for decades, and, you know, of course, his famous um, uh, event was when he would cover the Scopes trial in 1925, and were all these very cynical accounts of the Scopes trial, and, and then he appears in that, you know, that film, or the play in the film, uh, Inherit the Wind, uh, where Gene Kelly, oddly enough, plays a character based on Mencken, um, but a lot of his writing is still, uh, you know, not readily available, so I want to get that out there, and... Uh, uh, but horror fiction kind of is my basic theme, and I just finished, just about finished a book called 21st Century Horror, in which I treat uh, some of the contemporary writers in this field, and there's some really good work being done by, by writers who aren't terribly well-known, and I hope to get, get, get them out there a little bit more. Well, I hope, I hope you do, too, and I hope it goes on 
because I'm a film guy. I know you said you don't really get involved in media and stuff, but I can tell you the the horror flicks they have nowadays aren't really that good. They're just they're not what That's they right. used to be at all. Yeah. Well, here's something I can mention. I am actually working with some people on a Lovecraft biopic. So uh, we will have a film about Lovecraft, we hope, uh, mostly focusing on his marriage to, to his, you know, his wife, Sonia, Sonia Green. Uh, but I actually wrote a draft of a screenplay, even though I really didn't know much about writing screenplays, but I, I kind of uh, learned, learned as I went. But uh, I hope this film gets made. I mean, I, I have no idea. We still need, need to get some financial backing, but uh, I think it'll be an interesting film if it can, if it can pull it off. Well, where do we go from here? I think um, I've got to say, and I'll brag on you again, uh, I've talked to quite a few writers. I don't think I've talked to anybody that has written quite as extensively as you have. I'm curious about Lovecraft even more now. So you've mm-hmm. done your job for sure. You've done your job. Sure. Well, as I say, I've been, you know, I just celebrated my 60th birthday a couple months ago. Oh, happy birthday. Thank you. And, I, and I, I'll tell you, I've been... I, I therefore basically lived through this whole incredible renaissance of, of Lovecraft, you know, and I hope I've been a part of it, but uh, it's just amazing to me to see him, you know, become this worldwide phenomenon. I mean, it's, it's extremely gratifying that, that my work and the work of a lot of other people has kind of paid off because back in the 70s, you know, he was getting popular, but he was still didn't get a lot of the critical recognition. He was not regarded as a, as a great writer, uh, he was just, you know, some cheap pulp writer who happened to be getting some popularity at the moment but i felt that there was more substance to his work than a lot of p- critics were were felt there was and so that's where i devoted a lot of my attention to kind of interpreting lovecraft and showing that there is a lot of depth in his work and i think that's paid off as well well you've you're definitely super involved in your in your genre and your work i mean you were accepted for a phd program at princeton and that's just to be accepted into something like that says a lot. And you still moved along because you felt academia just wasn't doing it for you. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, uh, I think I, I stayed in the academic world because it's the only world I knew, you know, from my parents who were professors. I really, I led a very sheltered life up to the age, into my twenties. I just didn't know what else I could do with myself except to be a professor. But I just didn't, it, I, it never was a good fit for me. I mean, I I didn't think I'd be a good teacher, um, and and uh, you know I was in a program that was very different from what I ended up writing about. Mainly, I was in a program called classical philosophy, which is the study of the ancient Greek and, and Latin philosophers. And I just I couldn't see a way of doing that as well as all this stuff on Lovecraft. There was just not enough time in the day. Um, so I said, all right, I got to make a break here. I went into publishing, you know, in New York, and, and, and on the side I was doing Lovecraft stuff, and then eventually I was able to do, you know, full-time freelance writing. Eric, I'm so sorry. I've been, I haven't even let you ask a question, man. This is your guy here, too, so my guy now, though. <laughs> I'm just, I'm enjoying, yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm, li- I'm enjoying listening. Well, I mean. I may mention, okay, if you, it. you, you asked during the break uh, if I wanted to promote something. I, I have actually written a kind of autobiography or my memoirs. Um, it's called has a f- kind of a flippant title. It's called "What Is Anything: Memoirs of My Life in Lovecraft." So, um, and that just came out from Hippocampus Press a few months ago. In fact, it, it debuted literally on my birthday back in June. Uh, so it's out there, and uh, I hope people find it of some interest because I, I talk a lot about how I got into Lovecraft and what I've done about Lovecraft and other weird writers and some of the people I knew, you know, who uh, you know helped helped along. So uh, I hope I hope it's of some interest. Yeah, I hope it. Uh, I'll have to check that out. I'm going to your on your website here at stjoshi. dot org and looking at you know just the stuff that's just for sale here. Man, you got a, a quite a list. Um, but to, I noticed magazines too. I wish that would come back. I really do. Everybody's using like internet magazines and stuff, and that's cool. But I kind of miss the days where you had to order the magazine. It came in the mail, and it it was really meant something to read it. You know what I mean? Yeah, you I know it's a shame them. because I think a lot of good fiction got written in those magazines, and and now there just aren't that many fiction magazines out there for at least for the horror field. Some still in the science fiction field, maybe, but uh, yeah, it's, it's it's a shame. I, I mean, I've compiled anthologies, which basically are the new magazines of today, uh, but they only come out every you know every couple of years, and uh, you know, it's, it's it's not the same. Eric, I want can is it cool if I talk to? Uh... Uh, Mr. Joshi, about your project you're thinking about doing, just to see what he thinks. 
Yeah, yeah. That'd be, I, I would love to. Have, I'd actually love to have his input on that. So Eric is, you know, obviously we're on a radio network, but I'm into this. Uh, like we talked about last night with Bruce Smith, this this moth type storytelling stuff. You know, kind of like the, the old days of storytelling on audio, and. Mm-hmm. Um, Eric is really, really into Lovecraft, and he's really into radio, and he's always wanted to do a show. And I was thinking, you know, maybe we could do a show where he tells stories and, you know, put some cinematic stuff in the background and have guests every now and then, like short story type stuff, too, with a little horror. And uh, I don't know how well it would be, but do you think that it, that would be just curious if you think that would be a good idea? Oh, I think so. I mean, you know, Lovecraft in particular is so well suited to radio because, as, as Eric himself was saying, he leaves so much to the imagination. You know, you, you, he sort of hints at things and then lets your own imagination kind of go off on your own. And that's the sort of thing that works just wonderfully in radio. I mean, we've talked about that Lovecraft films based on Lovecraft really haven't been all that successful, but I think radio could be. There you go. That ought to spark well, I, your spark I can your think interest. of, yeah. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> well, and there are like other writers, a, many other a, writers a, work, work well on radio. I would think uh, Lord Dunsany, some of his work, would, some of his oh, more yeah. accessible stuff would work. Uh, Hal Newth would have practiced his art upon the knolls. Yeah, That's I mean, Dunsany no, was like such a great buddy. prose writer. I mean, I love his prose. It's so it's so musical, and then and that really comes out in, in, in listening to it, and an even better experience, I think, than, than reading it on the page. You know what I what I don't know about well, though, and what I'm curious about, and it's kind of a off question too, is uh, copyright stuff. Because I've always wanted to, you know, read. I mean, if you read somebody's story online, not make up your own story, but read somebody's story online, that's kind of copyright infringement, isn't it? I mean, I would think uh, it would be. It says that, well, there's there's a lot of copyright infringement on the internet, to be sure, but. Uh, um yeah, it's uh, copyright is a very complicated issue, but a lot of the writers we're dealing with uh, are pretty much out of copyright, and you can tell that because there are all these horrible what are called print-on-demand editions of, of you know print books that you can find wherever people just slap these books together just because the material is out of copyright, and uh, uh, best to avoid those if you can because they're usually badly put together. But um, yeah, but you know most much much of the best of Dunsany is out of out of out of U.S. copyright anyway, so it's. Uh, Available You're probably pretty safe. Yeah. You're probably pretty safe on that. Yeah, a lot of yeah. it's public domain. I mean, there was a. Uh, I used to get books on. You know, they were, it was a all volunteer network, and they would read. You know, all these old science fiction. You know, they read a lot of different things, but the genres I was was interested in had a lot of H.P. Uh, Lovecraft. They had a lot of Dunsany, E.E. Uh, e. Doc Smith. You know, a lot of these classic. Authors and classic sci-fi authors have their work has passed into the public domain because nobody kept up with, you know, keeping the copyright current. You know, right, because the time, prior prior think, to the new copyright law in the 1970s, you actually had to renew copyrights, and a lot of those copyrights never got renewed after 28 years. You don't have to do that anymore, but for older stuff, you did, and if it wasn't done, then the stuff did fall fall into the public domain. Oh, it's like what happened to uh, oh the 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 professor. He was a Civil War general. He took a sabbatical from Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. His family finally, you know, nothing was going on with his work because the man was a prolific writer and just got awful, wonderful way of turning a phrase. The family got tired of paying for nothing, and they let the copyright expire. And then all of a sudden, there's this re you know, Shelby Foote, you know, Ken Burns has a movie about the Civil War. Now, all of a sudden, <laughs> this is all up for grabs because the family left the copyright. So Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain's work had a renaissance. Well, I, I do have to say thank you so much for coming on the program. Um, well, I know we do a late night show, so it's it ain't it ain't easy for everybody to come on and spend time with us here. And uh, it's been a real pleasure. Like I said, you're the first, um, I guess, atheist writer that i've had on the show the first, not the first lovecraft writer but i can say definitely the biggest uh for well, sure I, I, I was i was delighted to be here and, and it was good talking to you thank you so much for your time i really appreciate it okay no problem
The website is stjoshi.org. I'm going to put that in the show notes. It's stjoshi.org. If you go check it out, uh, we're going to go into our break here. We're going to bring back in the third hour, we're going to have Ryan Gable on, along with Eric, if Eric still wants to hang out with us, kind of talk about some of this stuff. Uh, and um, again, thank you so much for coming on. It's been a real pleasure. Sure thing. All right, guys, we'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. More Lighting the Void coming up. FM. You're listening to Lighting the Void Radio. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? You'll love the new Paranormal Radio app from Talk Stream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in Paranormal Talk Entertainment including the network you're listening to right now. The Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. Do you want to lose weight but have no idea where to begin? The Fast Start Diet, a three-day weight loss plan, is the answer. Three days of nutritionally balanced, calorie-restricted meals delivered right to your door. No shopping, no measuring, and no cooking. Everything is prepared for you and ready to eat at home or on the go. The Fast Start Diet has all the amazing benefits of intermittent fasting without starving. We've helped thousands of people who have struggled to reach their weight loss goals. Isn't it time we helped you? With the Fast Start Diet, you'll lose weight and feel great. Find us on Amazon or go to FastStartDiet.com and use promo code TALK to get $10 off your first box. As a special bonus, we'll include our number one rated LiPo3 appetite suppressant spray free with your order. Whatever your diet plans are, start with us at FastStartDiet.com. Hey, Fringe FM listeners, did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or no Wi-Fi available, you can still listen to every minute of the Fringe FM by calling 701-719-3971. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. Saves your data plan and no extra cost if you have unlimited minutes. Call 701-719-3971. That's 701-719-3971. Listen to the Fringe FM on any phone, anytime, anywhere. How you doing today, guys? This is Garrett Lee. And this is Randy Warner from the Healers and Hellraisers podcast, a podcast about people. You're going to hear stories from the enlightening to the frightening told by those who lived it. Listen right here on the Fringe FM. Wednesdays at 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern, and on the Fringe Free For All, right here on the Fringe FM. Follow the Fringe FM on Facebook and Twitter at the Fringe FM. The Fringe FM loves hearing from you. Have a suggestion, comment, or question? We're all ears. Email talkback at thefringe.fm. Welcome back to Alighting. 
Filling the Void. We just got through speaking with author S.T. Joshi. Very interesting person. I'm going to grab some of those writings myself. Go check out the website, stjoshi.org. should be there in the show notes now. And remember, if you missed the live show, you can always catch the archives on YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, wherever. I don't charge for my archives. Not yet. Not yet. I don't charge for them yet. But uh, you, you can grab any of the old episodes there. Uh, now, I got a little bit of surprise for you guys in the third hour. I'm going to bring on a well-known radio host and a good friend of mine, Ryan Gable. I think Eric's with us still, too, but he's doing his own thing. You know, he's always busy, that guy. Ryan, thank you so much for joining us on the third hour. I know it's late for you, uh, so I appreciate your time. I really do. You got it, buddy. I'm glad to be here. Well, where do we well, where do we begin? First off, uh, I just want to say, uh, you know, coming over to the Fringe FM was um, a hard decision for you, and the be- to begin with, uh, I know that because you've been loyal to L and M Radio Network for many years, and uh, you know, you just want more people to hear your information. And in the beginning, you know, I've always had this, uh, I've always had this goal to have Fringe FM hosts just the best host on the internet. I would rather have three awesome hosts on my network and play replays all day long, you know, than have, you know, 30 or 40 different types of shows. And when the first time I heard the secret teachings, you know, honestly, I thought that you, you weren't on a network and a a friend of mine, Dave was like, you gotta, you gotta try to get this guy on the network. And it's not just that he runs a professional show. The information that he's putting out is next to none. And, uh, you know, so I kept listening to the secret teachings and I was hooked, man. I mean, you, you really do your research. You're an actual journalist. It's good to have you here. And right now I know that you got people swinging at you from all sides and you're really holding your ground and I'm very impressed by it. I just want to tell you that. Well, first off, I want to thank you, Joe, for giving me a platform on the fringe. And yes, it was a back and forth situation between this network and other networks because Rightfully so. Radio is a business, and it's difficult to grow a business, to grow a radio network when you have a show that is going back and forth between multiple networks that's not entirely exclusive. And I know that you, as well as the other network, the one that I was removed from recently, you both were very, very adamant about keeping me for a variety of reasons, but you were the most honest with me. And you gave me detailed information about everything from show numbers to your intentions. And I found you from the beginning to be much more professional and for this radio network to be more of a radio network rather than, and this is not taking a shot at anybody, rather than just a, not a podcast kind of a station, but something that doesn't necessarily sound like a radio network. It sounds more like somebody playing around with Skype and making a radio show here or there by cutting stuff together. That's not a shot at anybody. I'm just saying that the Fringe FM, from my point of view, sounds like a much more professionally run radio station and professionally hosted radio station with radio shows. And that's one of the main reasons that I'm very, very happy to be here on the Fringe now. And I also want to thank you, secondly, for your comments about my show, because that is my intention to provide unique perspectives on subjects. And I do it with comedy, too. Tonight's show coming up here in about 45 minutes, I'm going to address a couple of different topics from a unique and objective point of view, where the information, whether you've heard it or not, I've tried to, I will try to, uh, in the past, I will try to tonight, make it comical and to relieve some of the tension and the pressure that goes along with addressing subjects and pointing out inconsistencies as an investigator and a journalist that oftentimes gets you accused of burning bridges and starting wars and going back and forth with people, when that's not my intention. My intention is to provide a unique perspective and to provide information that is as objectively presented as possible. And uh, I was actually thinking while you were performing your interview Uh, the subject of religion. I just wanted to provide a different perspective on religion 
as per the subject of atheism, you read that article that I had sent you, the headline about how atheism is one of the fastest growing religions. I know that some people would dispute that and say, well, atheism is the opposite of religion. Well, I think not only as a symbol, but by definition, anything can be a religion. Radio could be a religion because religion, although it's defined as the belief or the worship of a superhuman controlling power, religion is also secondarily defined as a system of faith and worship. So those who, let's say, worship radio, they love radio so much. It's not a bad thing. They're listening to the radio every single night. They worship radio. They can't do anything without having the radio on. Well, then radio is their religion. And for atheists, not all of them, of course, but many atheists, like the Richard Dawkins types who adhere to science, they believe in a religion. It is a system of faith and a system of worship, a worship of materialism, a worship of the microscope, a worship of the telescope. And again, these are not bad things, but it is a system of faith and worship. And therefore, I think atheism is a religion. And that's coming from the point of view of someone who is not religious, who is not spiritual, and who is not an atheist. I just look at all information from a balanced point of view. Yeah, you do. You really do. And, you know, there's, look, we're in the future now. And this is why that we created the Fringe FM, because I guess, based on your definition, and I'll be happy to say it, the radio is my religion. It's one of my religions, I could say, I guess, because I keep the radio on all the time. And even when I'm asleep, I have the radio on. I hear the radio in my dreams. So it's not like, you know, people are looking at podcasting and radio as two different things. And I know there's people in the chat rooms and all kinds of people that are aspiring to be either a podcast host or a radio host. And I want to tell you, in the future, in the future, I don't care what anybody says, there will be no difference. There will be no difference. Right now, as we speak, some of the major terrestrial stations that are broadcasting on your radio dial, for the most part, are playing pre-recorded podcasts. That's right. They're playing pre-recorded podcasts. So the fact that we even have live shows being broadcasted right now is a big deal on digital radio. Yes, we're going to be working with Terrestrial. We've got hosts coming in. And this is something that I actually wanted Ryan to put on his show because I know so many people kind of want to do this thing. I mean, how many people have you ran into that "Mm, maybe I want to do a podcast or it's like everybody wants to do one nowadays, you know? Yes, it's very popular. It's fun. I mean, I always had interest in radio, but I never, ever imagined for a moment that I would do a radio show. Radio is kind of mysterious. It's obviously not like watching somebody on television. It's different. It's mysterious because you're listening to somebody's voice. You can close your eyes. You can imagine things kind of like you guys were talking about with Lovecraft. He kind of leaves it open to the imagination. Radio in many ways leaves it open to the imagination. And I'll tell you something that's kind of kind of humorous is that you hear radio hosts, big ones and small ones alike. You hear people that might do podcasts. And as far as I'm concerned, podcast gets this really negative rep podcasting in a in, in in a way where you record a show and then you publish it and it, it airs, that's, that's not a bad thing. It still takes mm-hmm. a lot of work to publish that show. But you listen to radio hosts. I don't know if you've had this opportunity, but then you meet these people and very, very, very rarely do they look anything like you thought they looked like. So radio leaves this mysterious air about it. And you don't know really unless you've seen pictures or you see a live feed – Really, what's going on in the studio? You really don't know who the person is. Some some radio hosts are entirely different on air as opposed to how they are off air. So uh, just in the sense of talking about radio, there's that mysteriousness about radio that makes it very, very powerful. And again, regardless if it's a live broadcast on terrestrial stations or it is a podcast, you're 100% right. There are actually car companies now that are moving to install. I saw this a couple of years ago. Uh, it was a um, like an auto magazine article about how car companies are going to start putting in uh, devices in the car so that they can pick up like podcast broadcast stations and things like that because the future of radio is not terrestrial. It will be internet based. 
Yeah, but see, also terrestrial, and, and I tend to disagree with that, but I'm in the mi- minority only because there's some terrestrial st- stations that are still kind of killing it. They're few and far between, but they're there, and they're learning that they're going to have to integrate with po- you know podcasters and people that do live digital radio to stay alive. Not only integrate with these people, but, you know, get exclusive. So the idea, and and I'll just tell you guys this, the idea to grow a radio network is to have hosts that are only exclusive to you so that, and I'm just speaking from a business point of view, so that the traffic only comes to your radio station. Now, in the future, uh, that's the way it's going to be as far as podcasting goes. And the way I do it is, as long as you're not on any other digital radio station, I don't care, right? Like, so uh, I only have one host, our program director now, that's on another digital radio station, and he simply does way more than, than I don't know, he just does a great show. It, it's not about his show at all. It's about what he does for this network. But he's also in radio, and he gets up, and he knows this, a pretty, Jeremy gets a pretty big chunk of his listeners from the fringe FM. So just like when you were on L and M, of course I wanted you to be with the fringe FM, but I damn sure didn't want to stifle you. And I didn't want to make you uncomfortable. And I didn't mind promoting L and M, you know, like I'm a fan even to this day of some of the hosts on L and M. I don't have anything against Michael Vera, Heather Wade, or any of those people. In fact, I find Michael Vera quite comedic sometimes, you know, I think he's, I think he's all right. I do. But here's the problem. And I'm going to say this with the utmost seriousness. Here's the problem, folks. If you're an aspiring podcaster that wants to do a live show, you're not getting the truth by a lot of these network owners. And it's not just the experience that I ran into, I guess, with, I don't know, I don't really like to say names, but whoever's running I don't think Michael's running it anymore. I don't really know what's going on. But anytime somebody tells you that they have millions of listeners, and I hate to even use the word red flag because a lot of people use it, but that's a damn red flag right there. This market that we're in, that you guys, we're all in this market of the paranormal, the esoteric, science fiction, all that stuff, it is in the millions. The market is in the few millions. But to say that you're a station that has millions of listeners is almost impossible in this market if you've done your study. Now, Clyde Lewis gets a millions of listeners because he's on several big markets in radio. He's also just that damn good. Coast to Coast is getting millions because they probably, and I don't really know that they're getting millions. I'm just assuming that they are. I've never actually looked at their their numbers, but I'm assuming they are because they've been around since, you know, Art Bell grew that. But everybody else... And if there's any network list, network owners listening to this, you know you're not getting listeners in the millions. So if you can't be honest with your host, say, for instance, somebody comes along and says, Joe, I want to do a radio show on your, on your program, right? I want to be on your network. And the first thing I tell them is, and I don't know if you remember the discussions I had with you, is it's going to start out slow, but it will grow. And that's the only thing that matters is growth. Right. And so I showed an eight week growth chart, not my total listenership, just a growth chart for anybody that needs to go to chart school. It's out there on the web that we gained 28,000 listeners. And that was 100 percent growth in eight weeks. Now, that's pretty good. It's not YouTube. I mean, I know people that drop YouTube videos and get that in the matter of day is like, you know, UFO seekers. But in live radio, that's pretty big. And I was proud of it. And you know what happened? Ryan, they used it against me and lied about it to boot. And that really kind of upset me. That's the only thing, honestly, that upset me about this whole thing. You know, the the name calling and all that other stuff, I don't really care about that. You know, in my opinion, no publicity is bad publicity. But to try to poach my host with a, with a, with a lie really did get to me. And it was hard for me to let go. But I'm pretty sure... I've let it go because if people can't see the truth for what it is now, there's no hope for you, so to speak, you know? Yeah. It's unfortunate that people are willing to lie about things so brazenly, but even to give them the benefit of the doubt on L and M, I feel as if they don't truly understand 
what those charts really are. And you've explained it to me in detail, and I didn't fully understand. And so I know for sure that uh, their program directors have not been doing programming or radio for more than just a couple of years at max. I don't think they really understand what they're talking about from all of the dealings that I've had with them. Plus, they run a publishing company that I was published under with a handful of other people. And with myself and four other individuals, they have breached all five of our contracts. So I'm not exactly sure they know how to publish either, let alone run a radio network. And unfortunately, when you deal with ignorance and somebody simply just continues to repeat and regurgitate the same information because they're ignorant and they refuse to acknowledge that they're wrong or to acknowledge that other information is more accurate than what they have, then it's kind of hard. If someone just says that XYZ is real, XYZ is real, and I say, well, here's proof that shows XYZ is not real, and they just keep repeating XYZ is real, XYZ is real. There are going to be many people in that audience who are going to continue to believe that XYZ is real because it's more difficult and it takes more time and effort to look at the information that's provided contrary to what that person is claiming and to see that, oh, they actually proved XYZ wrong. Okay, let me go where the information actually is. And I think you mentioned this too. There's a massive divide in the metaphysical, the ufology community, the alternative, the paranormal, everywhere for that matter, between those who are easily swayed by rhetoric and repeating information over and over and over again until it sticks in the brain, regardless of its accuracy and validity. And then there are, of course, others who are going to say, hold on a second. I think that this other person has some very relevant information and some important questions. I'm going to go look at what they have. And then when they go look at what that other person has, they think or they say, oh, that person has very accurate information. I'm going to go over here where the information is. And it's not about taking sides. I'm not taking sides in anything. What I'm doing is following the information. I've said this on my show before. I don't lean left. I don't lean right. I don't lean back. I don't lean forward. I lean where information takes me. And I don't support. I don't defend. I don't attack other beliefs just because they're not my faith. I just follow information. It's not about taking a side. Yeah, it's it's unfortunate, man. It really it it is. And I, you know, that old he said, she said, name calling stuff. It, it's just a part of the, the business. It, it happens. People, I don't care. Just like this guy brought up said, you know, Rich said you hit his numbers from it. Rich said a lot of stuff about me. Rich Giordano, of course, but he knows why. What I when I said, you know, you're either in or you're out. He knows the level of professionalism that I want on here. And saying you were in the bathroom or I played this clip or I didn't know or give me the benefit of the doubt, I can't just keep giving chances over and over again. I've got to make a decision. And I left that decision up to him, not me. And he made the decision. Also, as far as hiding numbers, I've given I've showed him timestamps and then he would of his numbers and then he would ask me, How are the numbers? Well, they're pretty much the same. So there was no hiding going on there from anybody. I mean What's right- this- Ryan, you even have a login to the server, to our streaming server. Right? I do. So you can see your numbers. Now, let me explain something to you about these, this, these, this real quick, okay? <sighs> streaming radio has been run off of streaming servers. For the longest time, people use Shoutcast, they use Icecast, and now the future of radio, whether you like it or not, as far as how the engine runs, is going to be cloud service. And that's what we use. We use a cloud service provider. It's super fast, what's called FTP protocol. I won't get into the technicals of it, but if you want to know why cloud and things like Amazon AWS is going to be the future of digital radio, all you have to do is take Kurt Harnax from the Telos Alliance's streaming school on YouTube. If you take the time to learn about it, it would actually do some good, some good for you. But most people don't take the time to learn about this stuff and just want to be told how it works or be sold on how it works. Secondly, we are not a, just a podcasting network. We have shows that are on Spreaker that do get relayed to our cloud network, but you know, Spreaker is built on an ice cast engine. So for a network that is built on an ice cast engine to talk crap about Spreaker is pretty redundant. And it's also pretty stupid. That's just my opinion, but maybe they don't know the technicals of it. Spreaker 
does one thing for a lot of hosts, and if anybody realized this, it was Jimmy Church. It gives you the power to run your own radio show, syndicate your RSS feeds to anywhere you want to, uh, privatize your archives if you like, as well as have links for all those things. It gives you a link to syndicate with any network that picks you up, which is more than what most people uh, have to offer. So just bashing Spreaker is pretty stupid all the way around. And by the way, if you're on Spreaker, you're on Amazon Alexa. And here's an, another little tip for you. Not that many people are using Amazon Alexa to listen to late night talk radio. The numbers are very, very slim. But you can still get th- these shows there if you want. Um, but the biggest thing is what a lot of people think is, Ryan, is because, oh, they're, you know, you're tied to an FM station, so you must get millions of listeners. That's not true either. All you have to do is go to radio-locator.com. You can see the coverage map of any radio station. And some of these radio stations people are bragging about aren't even listed. They're probably pirate radio stations, maybe not even have a license. And some of them only cover a golf course. Now, I'm not trying to talk down to anybody here, but let's think about this. How many, reality. Yeah, let's think about reality here. How many people listen to talk radio to begin with? Mm, it's not even half the population. Sorry to tell you. It's not even a third of the population. Sorry to tell you. Okay. So that's, that's the way it is. Now, how many people listen to talk radio in this genre? Yeah. The pie keeps getting smaller. How many people listen to talk radio in this genre in your time slot? The pie keeps getting smaller. And if that number itself might actually be in the millions, maybe, Okay, so for for a network to say they got millions of listeners, they don't even know their own market. That's just crazy. How can you run a business if you don't know your own market? Secondly, a radio station that broadcasts on a country club. Now, if you take that analogy of, of the market, how many people do you think are are in, on that country club or any of those houses listening to late night paranormal talk radio? Probably if I'm given, you know, let's say I'm being generous here, maybe 20 so you get more, you get about 60 listeners from the three FM stations that you have on golf courses. Wow. You see what I mean? That's what people are, oh, we're on FM now, so we must get millions of listeners. Now, there are certain stations that have bigger markets, like, say, the one that uh, that network has in Phoenix. But that station is pay to play, and they're only going to pick up the best host on the network. That's for advertising and sponsorship reasons. So you're being sold a bill of goods to think if your show is going to get on there. Now, maybe one day when you become good enough, you will get on there. The fact is, if you want to be on terrestrial radio and get heard, it's going to cost you money. And I learned this from my previous partners <laughs> that, that are on this network. And I started talking to people that run these things. And it's usually XDS satellite, things like that. And it costs a fortune. It's at least $100 an hour to be on these things. And if you're not getting sponsors, you're going to fall off the wayside. So you got to have talent. And so I decided after learning all this that from here on out, I made this promise to myself that I was going to base the Fringe FM solely, not off numbers, but off the content. I want to be able to tickle your ears. I want to bring old school radio back, even if I only have three hosts doing it, and the audience will come. So if you're an aspiring radio or podcast host, and you're concerned about numbers or you're being sold about numbers, I suggest you get the real information about numbers and not just somebody talking in your ear. Go get the documents. Have them show you a timestamp. Does that make sense, Ryan, what I'm saying? Like, that stuff has to matter. It makes perfect sense to me, and I think that if we are to examine, just like with anything else, information in an objective way without trying to prove something or without trying to defend our belief, we find what so many people claim that they're looking for. We find the actual truth. A lot of people in radio also bill themselves. It's it's more than just one radio station or one radio network. They bill themselves as the home of truth. And I know that in a way that's a marketing tactic, but to throw that word around, to me, that's a sacred word and to throw that word around as if it's nothing more than hey come listen to this radio show we have the best you know audio transitions or something like that 
to use that word like that, I think, is inappropriate. And for a network especially to use that word and be concerned with anything and everything except the truth is a little contradictory and uh, hypocritical to me. And that makes me feel as if I can't really trust the people that do things like that, nor could I trust the people that will take information out of context to support their point of view. And I know that although this radio network, the Fringe FM, and what you do, Joe, and what Jeremy does, what Eric do uh, does, what you guys do is you're trying to build a network and a business. And you know, because I've told you, my show is not about business. My show is about sincerely from the depths of my heart and soul yeah. expressing what I feel is necessary to discuss on any given night. And for me, it's not about business. When you hear the voice of Clyde Lewis, you're hearing the same heart when you, when you hear the voice of Ryan Gable. And in my opinion, you, you're the next Clyde Lewis. You still got a lot of time ahead of you, man. You still got a lot of show perfecting to do. And you really do look at it as an art too, because you can say it's just about information all you want, but I know, man, that you have a lot of fun when you do radio and that's what matters too. a lot. You know, you wouldn't be doing it if you wouldn't be putting money into the equipment and doing all these things, if you wasn't having fun and you don't want to take that fun away from, from anybody. And Ryan, you do a good show. If you stay at this, if you stay at what you're doing and you keep fighting people in the face of a crowd, when you know you're right and you've got documented evidence to, to, uh, say so, then just go for it, man. I can't promise you that you won't be sued or you won't have people trying to attack you. But how many times did that happen to Art Bell? Right. How many, how many times, no matter whether you like him or not, how many times has that happened to Alex Jones? He's a really great case study for this type of um, this type of slander and defamation is that people will. And and again, you don't have to like Alex Jones. Just look at what the situation is objectively. People claim he said something. He says, I didn't say that. They say, you did say that. He says, prove it. They can't prove it. So they say, well, he's enabling that kind of thought. He is promoting that kind of speech. We'll prove that he's doing that. Well, he's just promoting violence. We'll prove that he's promoting violence. And they can't do anything. They can't prove anything. So they file lawsuits. And the media reports in the lawsuits and says, Alex Jones did X, Y, Z. Alex Jones pushed a kid down. Alex Jones is aggressive. Alex Jones said nobody died. They, re- they keep repeating the same you know, talking points. Nobody died at Sandy Hook. You know, Atrazine is turning frogs gay. They don't even use Atrazine. They just say he said <laughs> the frog yeah. gay. They, they, they don't go into the details of it. And then when he comes out and is actually going to court and can prove and defends himself and they get the cases thrown out before it even goes to court most of the time, the media never runs a retraction. What they do is report the initial lawsuit as if he has done something illegal and then never retract it later. And that's the deception. And that's what happens not just to Alex Jones, but that happens on a more minor level to other people, to radio hosts, um, the business of radio or any other business for that matter. I can't stand where, the guy, but he does document a lot of stuff he, he talks about, or at least he tries to, you know? Yes, yes. And I think it's the people that actually provide information, whether you like them or not. People that provide information that is documented, I think that really irritates some that don't want I'm gonna to I'm going to sue you. Them. They try to yeah, scare so, you so you'll stop. Yes, they'll, they'll, they'll threaten to sue you. I've been threatened to be sued, not just recently. I've been threatened with lawsuits since I, I was on an FM station, Joe. I started out on FM. You know that, right? At college radio? Yeah, yeah, 91.5 FM WPRK. And that I had so many threats. Someone actually threatened my life at that school when I was, when I was doing the volunteer. I, I didn't go to the school, but I was doing volunteer radio. Someone threatened to kill me because of what I was talking about. And all I was doing was just having conversations at six in the morning saying, hmm, I wonder how the pyramids were built. People threatened to kill me. The security guards, for liability reasons, had to escort me off of the radio station property. That's and cool. I, yeah, I think it's <laughs> – Sorry, I think, I think that's cool. I think it's cool. I don't know exactly what it was that I was saying, but it, it threatened somebody. Somebody got offended. Uh, but in terms of the lawsuit – I was contact. Well, the school was contacted. The radio network station, rather, radio station was contacted by the Southern Poverty Law Center. They were claiming that I was making uh, statements that promoted terrorism 
because I talked about the IRS and things like that. I was threatened to be sued by them and more recently on the Dark Matter Network before I was re- I was removed from there because of the uh, pedophilia subject that they didn't want me to discuss. I was threatened twice to be sued, and Keith Rowland was actually threatened with lawsuits. Another reason I think, objectively speaking, from my point of view, he had to remove me uh, initially was because people were threatening to sue him and me for not just the pedophilia and the church, but they were threatening to sue me because I said, and, and I'm not joking about this, Joe, this is real, this actually happened. I said Dairy Queen is not real ice cream. They don't have real ice cream. And that was a statement that I made, and it actually says it on the website, and yet people threatened to sue because they like Dairy Queen. It wasn't like some lawyer working for Dairy Queen thought, oh, this will be an easy lawsuit. They just threatened to sue me because I'm guessing they liked to go get blizzards. (laughs) But people can just threaten to sue you for anything. But if you're getting threatened to be sued like that or people are criticizing you when you know that you have the proof, they try to implant that seed of doubt. I've had that seed of doubt planted. I thought, well, maybe I'm looking at this wrong. Maybe I'm maybe I'm wrong. Maybe this isn't what I maybe this evidence isn't what I thought it was. And then I realized, no, it definitely is. I have all of the information. Nothing is out of context. I'm right. They're wrong. We're moving on. Man, uh, yeah, well, that's what happens when you're when you're uh, stirring stuff up. Uh, Eric, turn your uh, turn your background, turn your radio off. <laughs> all right, all right. So I just wanted to bring Eric in here just in case. So here's the thing: I want to tell everybody about um, just real quick, and I will skip the break because I can. Uh, I, that's why I play so many breaks during my show. So if I want to skip one, I can. Um, the thing about the the servers, right? When you see those timestamps, if you look at it, well, let me just tell you how Icecast and Shout, Shoutcast works. And I want to glaze your eyes over, okay? But when you go on places like TuneIn or TalkStream Live or other places, they want your link, okay? And so that link you give them is your server link plus the port number plus play MP3 or AAC, whichever one you send them. Now, the reason I know that some of these numbers are the same is because when you inspect these places, too, it's the same IP and port number. So that tells me the listenership is pretty much what I'm reading is pretty accurate. Does that make I hope that makes sense to you. Now, that number, this is also what I learned in radios. People's attention spans are just, you know, you would assume that they're going to be in your show and sit there and listen forever, right? But the reality is, is the average listening time on a radio show is 18 minutes. This is why a lot of people like podcasts, so they can come back and finish it later, just like a book. So when you see that timestamp number, that that number, what's that noise? Somebody typing or something? That number is um, that number is only a timestamp of how many people are tuned in at that point in time. But that number rolls, so people are tuning in, people are leaving, they're coming back, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So for all you network owners out there, if you want to give a real timestamp to your listeners, you have to wait until that that show period is over, and then you pull, let's say, like the last three hours, and it shows you how many unique listeners you had, how many total listeners, and the average listening time. That's what's going to matter. I don't even know why I'm telling this, so I guess I'm helping my competition here, but that's what's going to matter to a show host, right? Their actual listenership. So even the the post that, which by the way, I think they re, they combated your statement, Ryan, by saying, "Well, Ryan only had forty or to a hundred or so listeners." I guarantee you, they were just looking at a timestamp. They didn't pull the whole three hour session that you were on. Not to mention your replays, and not to mention your downloads. So you got to be accurate with your host. And I'll tell you why. Ryan is an author. So let's say you're an author, you're an aspiring author, and you want to get your name out there. Now, I'll, I'm going to do you a disservice if I say, oh, man, we're, we got millions of listeners. We're number one. You know, like the football, we're everywhere. A lot of football teams say they're number one, and they get their ass beat on game day, right? But, yeah, you know, the, the thing is, is you got to be accurate with the data. And I say, okay, look, when you this is the average listenership in the time slot that you're going to be going into. I can help you d- grow your show if you would like. I can even help you produce it. And we can work on content because content, I don't care what, you can't just get on and talk. Nowadays, content is everything. Keeping people's attention 
is everything in this field. So if you do a good show, if you're informative, compelling, entertaining, you're going to do just fine. If you look at it as an art, people are going to find your show. It doesn't matter all the manipulative things you do. Don't put links there. Don't talk about other radio hosts. Look, that crap don't matter. If you do a good show, people will come. And that's all you need to worry about. And so if you want to come on The Fringe FM, this is what we're focused on. Growth, content, how good is the show? And the really, really good radio hosts, by the way, they know this is the secret too. Not just to muck things up and say whatever. And by the way, that timestamp that they, they, they're talking about about your listenership on their network also confirms by their own mouth that they don't get millions of listeners. Think That's about that right. for a second. Kind of, kind of uh, ironic and uh, just, justice for them posting that, that Ryan only gets 100 or 30 or 40 listeners. Well, that proves that you don't get a million listeners, so either way, you're wrong. And I've got listeners that have been working in talent their whole life. I won't mention any names, but they follow the show and they message me and they say, hey, that was a good show the other night. And they'll say, hey, look at this actor or look at this radio host. You know, it's not about when people say be yourself and everyone's going to love you. First of all, we know all truths are about or half truths at best, right? Everyone may love you. But that doesn't mean they're going to stick around for two or three hours and listen to you. And you have to, you can't take that for granted. Anybody that's going to stick around and listen to you, take two or three hours out of their life to sit and listen to your mouth. You have to take that. You have to, that has to be a serious thing to you. You can't take it for granted. And if you do take it for granted, don't get upset when nobody's listening to you. And that's, yeah, that's kind of what I've been dealing with since I started this thing. That That's one thing that, in terms of how you produce a show and put it together, I've been experimenting with that for years. And I think that there are some well-known radio hosts who are still experimenting. They're still growing and trying to figure out how to do it better and what, what makes them even more comfortable and what makes them a better host. I mean, I had to learn when I first started, I really would just come in and start talking and I wouldn't have much of an idea of what I was going to talk about, maybe a few news articles. And over the years that progressed into interviewing guests and putting together shows with unique topics and having conversations with a co-host or something like that. And then I kind of found my niche where now I focus on unique subjects. I allow something to come to me each day. And then I do begin just sort of randomly talking with an idea in mind. And then I know that I personally have a talent to be able to formulate that into a, a theme throughout the broadcast, and then at the end of the show, I kind of tie everything together. But that's me. And the reason that my show is not a typical radio show is because my show doesn't, and your show really doesn't do this either, Joe, and it depends on if you're on a bunch of terrestrial radio stations, if you have to have hard break, breaks, if you're doing a Clyde Lewis-style show where you, ha- where you have like 300 affiliates, you mm-hmm. have to take a break, break four or five times an hour, and every time you come back, you have to set it up again. So you end up talking about new material, maybe for like 45 minutes of the show total. Everything else is a rehashing and a building up from the original segment or the original two segments. And if you just do a show like I do, raw content all the way through, some things are regurgitated, but mostly it builds from the first minute to the last minute, three hours later. There's a lot of new content there. And that and that's what I provide. That's why I have an archive, and that's why I suggest that people, if they're interested, they go and subscribe and they get access to everything. Because otherwise, I'm not – I'm just not the kind of a person who feels – even if I was going to be on a big radio network or have tons of affiliates, it would be really, really hard for me personally to be able to formulate a show in that capacity. So no matter what you're doing, whether you're doing a show like Joe or you're doing a show like me, you have to find your own unique niche – what makes sense to you, whether it's talking for three hours and tying everything together like I do or taking a break every half hour and having a guest on most nights like Joe does. You have to find your own niche, just like with anything else in life, whether it's business or it's art or it's sports, you find what you're good at. Right. And I, and, um, I want to talk about, too, real quick, the straw man. The straw man attacks that happen 
because people, as a radio host, you're going to have people that hang on your every word. For instance, you know, uh, when Rich and I separated, you know, he there was a lot of straw man stuff going on. And I don't really, I don't have the time to explain straw man, but let me give you an example, okay? Rich Giordano is a crazy host who doesn't care about being professional. He pretends like he wants to be a professional radio host, but all he does is screw up and he self-sabotages himself and he's just a big crybaby that's super self-defensive and I mean he just needs to grow up or he's never going to get radio. He's never going to get big. Um and you know, he's done this on a lot of other networks too. Uh he just is just a big mouth who says he cares but in the end he really wants to do his own thing and take over your network and play this Howard Stern game uh, and see what he can get away with but pretend like You know, not to mention he needs more attention than everybody else, and he thinks the world revolves around him. Do you see what I did there? 90% of what I just said is not true. But I can make it sound very true. Didn't it kind of sound like that some of that was true? But it's not. The truth is, is that Rich Giordano does better by himself. He has a certain type of show. The truth is he put more effort than I've ever seen him put in to any radio show when he was on the Fringe FM. I think he did his best. It just didn't work out. Um, And we had our differences, but the fact remains is that he's a good radio host. And as long as he keeps at it, he's going to do fine. Um, But he did straw man me a little bit. He tried to say I was a lying bully and stuff like that, but I gave him the benefit of the doubt here because Rich has been in this, has had to deal with what Ryan's had to deal with, which is the second thing I'm going to talk about. The divide is really happening, folks. So you need to figure out, and I don't like to get polar about things, but there is a true divide going on in in radio, especially right now. There is people that project things onto you, like their image. We got millions of listeners. That's an image quote. Uh, we're number one. That's an image quote all about marketing and imaging. And it's not true. What's happening is though, because I study these servers and until you other network owners actually cover up your servers, like remove that file, I'm going to continue to do so. Hate to tell you, you're making it public. But what I am seeing is the divide. More people are going where the real information is documented information, intelligent type hosts, or hosts that are about talent. They're go- what I'm saying is, is they're going to where the content is. That's where they're going. Not just where somebody's on a radio show that has a big name. If you're not providing quality information, or you're not compelling, or you're not interesting, or you're just flat out boring, or the audio feed just sucks, your audio quality, that stuff that annoys people's ears, that stuff sucks too. And I don't have the best audio quality, but I'm working on it, right? And that's what's important to me. But what I'm saying is, some of you can see this, some of you have talked to me about it, that the majority of the people are going to where the best content is, not where the best imaging is. And you'll find that when you listen to shows like John B. Wells, um, Clyde Lewis, other, there's a, a million shows I can name. Phil Hendry, where people are about the content, the artistic quality of the show, or quality information that's documented evidence, and they can see both sides of the story. And the majority, I can, I've showed it to you before, the majority of people are going that way. Just like a long time ago when I think Heather quit uh, Dark Matter and that whole debacle and people were messaging me about it. Like, what do you think about it, Joe? This and that. And I saw another network saying, we're number one. Now, this was back in the day. We're smashing them, right? We're smashing them. Sounds good coming out of the guy's mouth. But when I dropped the files, it was actually the other way around. Dave Schrader was killing them. So I just want you guys to know that when you're listening to a voice on the radio and they're talking about other people or numbers or how they're number one, honestly, most of the time it's BS. And secondly, it really doesn't matter. Even right now, I hate to be talking about this stuff right now because it really doesn't matter to you. And I know it doesn't matter to you. But but every now and then as a radio host, even network owner, you have to defend yourself. When this is over, and it's going to be over real soon, trust me, we're going to keep delivering, try to deliver what matters to you. 
if that makes any sense. I hope I'm not just rambling now, Ryan. No, no, I actually have a way I can turn your point into a uh, 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 an interesting concept that I'm going to cover on my show here very soon after your show is over. And that is, not only do you find that divide in the radio world, you of course find that in the radio world is a microcosm of a much larger macrocosm elsewhere. And you find the the nature of those types of claims, like we're number one, we have the best shows, we're the best network. You find that also as a microcosm within a much larger macrocosm. And so if you were to look at, let's say, a story from mainstream media, how about the Solar Observatory in New Mexico and how it was shut down for security reasons? Now, I could make jokes about that, and I could say that the th- the reason I think it was shut down was because Heather Way decided to run in there and start shaking people and demanding that they disclose alien life, and that she decided to do that rather than run into Area 51 and do the same there. I could make a joke about it. I could laugh. Maybe five people got that joke if they, they know what I'm talking about. Or I could look at the different stories that were told. Some people say there was a leak of chemicals there. Some people say that the Russians hacked into it and... Some people say that another country hacked into it. There is a military installation, Alamogordo. There's white sands there. So it's close to a military installation. But maybe the real reason was because a bomb was sent through the mail. Maybe some employees were threatened. They had to close down the post office, the observatory, and the homes of those employees. That was one of my thoughts. Not saying it's right or wrong. But in analyzing that, there are numerous possibilities. But unfortunately, what happens is there's an immediate divide created because – And I know that you don't necessarily say these types of things, but this is what I do on my show, Joe. I call people up directly by name. This is what I feel the Wilcock, the David Wilcock cabal does. They take stories like that and they'll say things like, for example, this is not something that David Wilcock said, but this is an example of the type of thing that he talks about. They'll say something like this. Well, you know, there are alien spaceships and they're in space and they're flying around the earth and we've seen them near the sun. And instead of asking for proof, most of his audience just says, wow, that's amazing. And then the proof that's provided is the observatory in New Mexico was shut down, and it's a solar observatory. So see, all the stuff I said about UFOs flying around the sun, it's real because this observatory was shut down. But that's circumstantial evidence, and those two subjects are totally unrelated. You have no proof that there are ships flying around the sun, per se. You just have a story in the news that's provable because it was in the Chicago Tribune and local newspapers that says the observatory was shut down. Those two things have nothing to do with each other. And so if you are to, as I have, suggest that the solar observatory being shut down in New Mexico has nothing at all to do with aliens, or maybe it does, but to suggest that it has nothing to do with aliens and maybe it's more terrestrial, then you, as I have been, will be accused of not believing in aliens. Didn't say I didn't believe in aliens. I just said I don't think that that story has anything to do with aliens or spaceships around the sun or anything like that. Yeah. And that's the divide. That I'm, that's the divide I'm talking about, Joe. That needs to stop. We're looking at things objectively. And just because I don't believe that aliens shut down a solar observatory – doesn't mean that I don't believe in extraterrestrials, doesn't mean that I don't explore that subject. Just because I don't support one person who's at the perceived forefront of so-called research and people who have insiders doesn't mean that I don't follow a very similar path. But I look at things objectively, and if I believe something, I am going to demonstrate that information by providing you with documentation or, at the very least, logical, critically thought out observations and analysis of that information. And that's what I do on my show, the secret teachings coming up next. And do you know why you got to do that? You have to do that because intelligent people aren't convinced of, of your, what you're saying. They're just not, it takes somebody that's intelligent. It takes them a long time to learn to trust you. This is why Bob Woodward has mounds and mounds and mounds of archives when, you know, when he busted the Watergate thing, Nixon and his whole people would get on the microphone and say, Oh, Bob Woodward's just, they even say he's just a baby. He needs to grow up. He, he's evil and it's just sleazy what he's doing. But the fact remains is he busted them out and they had nothing that all they could do was name call and, and, you know, and get real dramatic and look at, yeah. And here's where you and I, 
would probably disagree. You think that fight is still worth fighting because there's people out there that need convincing. I'm the older I get, Ryan, the more I believe, look, if those people are going to believe that there's no hope for them anyways, you know what I'm saying? So I just let it go. But here lately I'm finding that a lot of people don't want you to let it go. They want you to fight for them. They want to know the truth, right? They want to know what's really going on. So maybe you should fight for them. So you got to learn what battles to, to choose and which ones to, to leave alone. And, um, you know, if for anybody that wants to know how real liars work, all you got to do is watch the movie, the informant that's based on a true story. Uh, you know, it really is. For example, like, you know, I show all of my radio hosts, every one of them, their show stats whenever they ask. And I'm totally transparent. And, you know, every time they ask me, I just give it to them no matter what. I mean, you can say what you want, but that's the truth, right? Do you believe me, Ryan? I do because you've given them to me directly. I just lied. Do you see how convincing that is, though? Do you see how lying works? I don't show all of my hosts the numbers, right? But I'm trying to prove a point here. How easy it is to lie and make it sound like the truth. And even some of these people lie and believe their own lies. I don't show them all their numbers, especially right now because I'm trying to figure out who leaked my information. But I did show you yours because I trust you. Uh, And for the most part, I think the mole is gone. So if you are a host on my network, you hit me up for numbers, you're going to get your numbers. But I'm just trying to prove a point, how liars work. A lot of liars don't even know that they're lying. It's, It's like they've done it so much, it's just subconsciously natural to them. Well, they begin to believe it. Yeah. Let let me ask you a question. What about the issues that have been had with you as a network owner and me as a radio host being vehemently attacked by those people who say that you and I have have done something wrong or that we're bad people? Why do you think other networks do that? Do you think it's and I don't mean this from an egotistic standpoint. Do you think it's because that they are threatened or do you think that is? Childish behavior. I think it's because they're threatened. But I'm not, I didn't know, like, I don't have an issue with Heather Wade. Heather knows this. I've, I've messaged her. I kind of looked up to her as a mentor a long time ago until I saw some, uh, well, you know, she's a human too. And I don't know the whole story about that and I don't want to, but after listening to other shows, I kind of just, I haven't lost any respect that I had for her before. And I don't think she's a, that bad of a host honestly i know there's people that disagree with me on that but i just i don't really listen to it uh but there's if people think i'm a bad person i'm just i really don't when i say this i mean this i really don't care it's when people lie about me that i'm trying to learn to get over because i've had some real straw man attacks that are so convincing that just aren't true that, that bother me but anyways i'm just learning to let it go Actually, hey, the older me, I get, the more I'm learning to let it go. I know you got to go, though. Well, no, I was going to ask you in about uh, if you have 30 seconds to explain it. What is this magical server stuff I keep hearing about? Oh, well, when I dropped the links to the stats, somebody and then they deleted the comment after they did it. But somebody said, that's not our that's not our numbers. That's just one of the streams. No, that's that's your one of you have two servers that's one of your server that shows all the mount points and that's the same mount point and the same server and uh port number that you're delivering to all these other affiliates because i inspected those two so that's your real number and i said sorry hon there's no magical server somewhere that's the information now there's a file you can remove if you want like uh, other hosts or networks have done because they're smart enough There's a file on IceCast that you can remove so nobody can see your numbers. So if you want to lie to people about your numbers, I suggest you remove that file. That'd probably be the smartest thing for you to do. Um, But I'm not out here to attack anybody. I'm more concerned about the new person that wants to do a podcast or the the person that wants to get into this field uh, because there's so much deception going on. And believe it or not, I understand why some of these networks pad numbers, but it doesn't mean that you should do it. It's wrong. And it doesn't do anybody any justice. It really doesn't. And it kind of makes things daunting for somebody that's put their whole life into their subject matter only to get on a radio network and never get anything from it because, you know, they either think, well, I guess I must suck. 
But the truth is, the numbers weren't there to begin with, and nobody's helping you develop your content. They're just turning you on and hoping everything works out. And, and making some money off of and, it. And that's it. And, you, you know, we live in a day and age of content, keeping people's attention, and that's all that's going to matter. So if you want to compete in the next 10 years, that's what you got to do, and that's what we're trying to do. But uh, I know you got to get your show on, and we got to get the heck out of here, man. I all appreciate right, you coming on, Ryan. I appreciate you having me. The Secret Teachings will be on next, and I'm going to explore the same type of concept throughout the whole show. I've been doing this my whole life. Many of you have been interested, perhaps, in the unknown and things like that, and I don't like it when people spread disinformation, willingly or unwillingly, because it makes my life and your life more difficult. So I'm going to get into that next on The Secret Teachings. Yeah, and you can check that show out at the also uh, on uh, thefringe.fm. He's not doesn't do that show live on Spreaker, or at least not yet. Um, if you want to hear that show, just listen to the Fringe FM. We got to get out of here. I want to thank author St. Josie, Eric Markham, Ryan Gable, all of you guys. This show was produced by the Fringe FM. It cannot be rebroadcasted without written permission. The music was by Chronox, Bundy, Space Station, and Kevin McLeod. We'll see you guys tomorrow night.